Okay, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the March 28th, 2023 Asheville City Council meeting. If you could just take a moment to silence your cell phones. Um, we have a table out in the hall to sign up to speak. If you, if you decide you would like to speak at the meeting, please just sign up out there if you haven't already. And someone will send me the list of speakers, hopefully. Maggie, can you, it's, it's already in there somewhere? You have it. Oh, thank you. Got it. Which computer? <laughs> All right. And if you would please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, Council, we've had a request to remove item I and vote on that separately by Councilwoman Roney. So if somebody's thing is making noises, but um, if someone could make a motion to approve the consent agenda without item I. Um, Kim, so moved. Second, Sage. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We have two people signed up to speak under the um, consent agenda. For folks who speak tonight, you'll have three minutes to speak, and please just watch the lights on the lectern. Green means go, orange means you are getting close to the end, and the red and the beep means stop. Um, and the first person signed up to speak under the consent agenda is Paul Tay. The, uh, uh, my street name is uh, Bluntman Bob. I prefer to go by Bluntman, but before, because of legal reasons and for court, court document purposes, it is what it is, what it says. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a new uh, resident of Asheville right here, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a unsheltered here and homeless, and I want to speak on the homeless issue. And uh, the consent item that I, I signed up for is, uh, is uh, I guess, number L. Is that right? Speed limit, yes, ma'am. Well, um, I, I'm going to stay germane to that uh, particular topic. I'll speak about the homeless issue on a, on a on the public hearing. So, just so you don't kick me out because it ain't germane. So, I'll be germane about it. Well, here's the deal about speed limits. American traffic engineers purposely design roadways to kill anybody who ain't in massive hunks of rubber and metal. It is, it is, the roadway is really designed to kill pedestrians and bicyclists. Okay? So the speed limit idea is a great idea going down from 20 miles an hour to 15 miles an hour we were crawling. What that does is basically just makes all the drivers just impatient. Okay? You need to do more than speed limits. We need to talk about redesigning the roadway so it don't kill people who ain't driving these massive hunks of rock, rock, metal and rubber. Right? It's kind of like this. We're in here in this uh, fine room with all the fine furniture like this and looking like the classic um, city hall. But if you were lucky in a, a different kind of city hall designed real modern like, you probably act a little bit, bit differently, wouldn't you? Like I was, uh, had a chance to, to, to come out here uh, uh, last couple days um, and uh, met with uh, some of the staff, and, and uh, I've been in those city halls and whatnot, and this here city hall is like real, real homey. It's like real up close and personal. For, my, for me, probably a little bit too, Sometimes a little bit way too up close and personal for my taste. But then when you get to a different city hall, like maybe from LA or you know Dallas or whatever, and you go see city, city halls designed differently, more modern, you're gonna act differently. Am I right? That's what I'm talking about here. That if we design these roadways really to 
to keep from killing pedestrians and bicyclists. I think that's what y'all are trying to do, okay, by lowering the speed. Speed, speed kills, by the way, right? So. Thank you. Um, the next person signed up to speak is Ben Stockdale. Hello, counselors. Good evening to you. <clears throat> My name is Ben Stockdale. I live in Asheville. I grew up in Tryon, which is down the road. I graduated from UNC Asheville in 2018, and I've been living in Asheville since 2016. And I'm really excited to be talking with you today because I would like to share just my part of a shared vision that so many members in our community have. And I'd like to talk about the synergies between some of the visions that we share in the community. Two of the largest initiatives that I see our community running with right now is the sustainable clean energy economic development piece as well as the reparations movement and the reparations process that's undergoing. And I see this synergy of those two aspects because as we continue, you know, if you, you're driving down West Asheville, you see the reparations mural, what does it say? Cut the check. What do you need to cut the check? You need money, you need revenue. How can we get that? We can get that by creating another economic driver in Asheville aside from tourism. And I see that as the multi-trillion dollar clean energy industry that's going to continue to transition the fossil fuel industry, which is what every, three, every single dollar in our economy has been going through. And it's gonna change that and it's gonna bring it through the clean energy industry, which Asheville is and continue to be a leader on. And I see Climate City as this amazing opportunity. This is a term that was co coined in 2018. We got national attention for this being Climate City USA. And you know, I think there's now a resurgence of that, of that energy and that movement to lean into this brand. And from my perspective, it's done if the clean energy industry and the transition to clean energy is done with equity. And so I see this, this synergy that can exist between developing this economic driver in Asheville as clean energy. That means clean energy development, actual construction jobs in our community, developing rooftop solar. But like what I do, I work on projects all over the country, but I'm developing here in Asheville. My company, Pine Gate Renewables, is headquartered here in Asheville, and we're a national company. That can happen in Asheville. So as the vice chair of the Blue Horizons Project Council, or Blue Horizons Project Community Council, we might be working on the name, but at any rate, I'm, I'm a leader now and I wanna to continue to be working with you all. I wanna be answering any of your questions. I've been working in clean energy since 2017 when I spoke to you the first time about the 100% clean energy resolution when I was starting the group Renew AVL that I did with my fellow students at UNCA. Thank you for trusting us and passing that resolution. Now let's take it to the next level and really be, build the clean energy industry in Asheville as something that can be uh, an economic driver on par with tourism in our community. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you for your service on Blue Horizons Committee, Task Force, whatever we're calling it. Thank you. Um, and let's welcome back Tim Sadler, long time no see. Wow. Uh, Mayor <laughs> and uh, City Council, I'm Tim Sadler, back uh, after a couple of years here um, out of town, noticed on the consent agenda there was something I was curious about. The, um, it was item J and K. And just wondering if either of those projects went to a, a black owned contractor if, if not, why? And um, I um, also really appreciated what Ben had to say. Like I thought that the pairing of renewable energy and reparations is a great idea. There are um, something called ESOPs and some money available. Um, spoke with Clark Duncan about this. And there might be some way of kind of figuring something out around that, but Duke might not be too happy about it. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, that's the last person signed up to speak under consent. And I don't know, uh, Deborah, if anybody is here who can speak to the contract 
regarding Stevens Lee Recreation Center, item J and K, those are both um, regarding Stevens Lee and the contract to J Bartholomew Construction. Uh, it, I don't know if yeah. anybody is aware of the. Oh, wait, oh, Jay is Jay. making his Dennis entry, Dennis. and D. Tyrell, we have backup. And, and Mayor, if you go to the um, staff report, so, uh, yeah. it talks about vendor outreach efforts. Oh, okay. uh, Jay Dennis, Capital Projects Director. Um, well, I'm happy to answer any questions. Jay, the question was about whether we whether this particular contract goes to any uh, minority women-owned business? Uh, if I, the staff report would indicate that there was no minority women-owned businesses uh, that were on the, as sub, submitted as subcontractors on this prime contract. So no, no one bid on it? Out, outreach right. was done. Outreach um, we only received one bid. We had to open that bid twice um, in order to actually have a successful uh, bid on this project. All right, Council, we don't have anyone else signed up to speak under uh, the consent agenda. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda without item I. Before we move forward with the vote, I just wanted to say that um, I really appreciated an item O. Um, this might not mean a lot um, for some folks, but if you ride the bus regularly, waiting to get your um, transit updates, um, being able to communicate that you're maybe running a little bit late or need to pick up your kids or something like that, and having Wi-Fi on the bus is huge. But this first came up, the first time I heard it was from Sabrina Raven, who is a transit rider who served on our transit committee. And it's just a reminder to me that having people that are impacted by our services, it's so important to have them at the table um, in the initiation and the implementation. So thank you to Sabra and all of our um, impacted folks who bring their um, subject matter experience to our advisory boards. I wonder if it might help increase ridership. Check your email on the way to work for the first time or something. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, and then do I have a motion to approve item I on the consent agenda? This is Sage, I'll move. It's Maggie, I'll second. All right, I have a motion and a second. Any further questions or comments? Yeah, I'll just add um, some clarity. So just to be really consistent that the part of this that is funded um, through civil asset forfeiture funds, which we've had lengthy conversations on at the previous public safety committee. Um, I still haven't seen um, which neighborhoods the um, funds were acquired from, but I can expect that they came from neighborhoods where they were extracted um, from neighborhoods that are really vulnerable to violent crime and who need investment in the targeted root causes to address that violent crime. Um, so to be consistent, I am um, voting no on item I. It's not the work that is being done, it's the issue, it's how we do it, that's important. All right, any other questions or comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Wait, so you did? Sorry, no, no, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm on the note, too. no, sorry. <laughs> Um, all right, folks, we're going to move on to presentations and reports. First, we have the manager's report, and I'll turn it over to Deborah Campbell, our manager. Thank you, and good evening, everyone. Um, Mayor, we uh, need to first apologize to Environment and Safety Committee because, for the most part, this presentation is going to be a repeat. It's so good, though. Of what you, <laughs> appreciate Sorry. it. Uh, what you saw and heard at your committee meeting and it is going to be an update on the crime data, and Chief Zach is going to present that, and then we will have a little bit more explanation on the Community Responder Program, and I guess actually the Community Responder Program will be an introduction uh, to a pilot program that we are proposing, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chief Zach, and... Um, Thank you, good evening. Uh, this presentation will cover uh, our end-of-year crime data for uh, 2022. Uh, we'll also highlight some operations uh, that we performed throughout the year that proved to be very successful. And uh, we aren't, Ms. Campbell, we're not doing recruiting. Sorry, there's we're not, Are we covering recruiting we as well? We are. Yeah, no. and we will give you an update on our recruiting effort. Although violent crime Trends have been discouraging. APD is committed to ensuring Asheville continues to be a safe place to live, do business, shop, recreate, and visit. We did see a historic 
once again, a historic rise in violent crime in 22, but again, that's also consistent with what we're seeing a lot nationally. Our crime, our high violent crime rate is primarily driven by a 17.5% increase in aggravated assaults. In spite of the serious deficit of resources, we are aggressively deploying officers to respond to various types of crimes, especially violent crime. To effectively address increasing crime in our community, we must continue to strengthen public safety and the responsibility of every sector of our community. So this report, there's, there's some bad news, but there's also some good news. Uh, as we're seeing, basically since 2019, we continue to see a fall in, uh, in property crime. Initially in, in 2020 and 2021, we thought that was more COVID related, but it appears um, some of our efforts are being successful. And for the fourth straight year, or for the third straight year, we're seeing a drop uh, in property crime, and that's a 5% uh, decrease from a year ago. And our property crime would be your burglaries, your larcenies, motor vehicle theft, and arson. And that's according to uh, FBI's uh, Uniform Crime Reporting Program. Now for the bad news. Uh, we did see another increase in um, violent crime from 21 to 22, 17.5% roughly uh, rise. And again, that's historically high. You can see where we've been trending since 2013, so the problem didn't just appear overnight, we've been on kind of a 10-year run here where we have seen an occasional dip, but overall just a rise in violent crime. Violent crime being defined as homicide, rape, robbery, armed robbery, aggravated assault, again, according to the Uniform Crime Report program by the FBI. So what have we been able to do? I mean, our, I think our, our, our staffing uh, concerns are well documented. I don't think I need to go into that at this point. So where we were often relying, our proactive efforts uh, had a lot to do with just presence and remaining visible and creating a, a physical deterrence just by our mere presence. We haven't been able to do that. So what we've had to do is really rely heavily on data and try and find and put our resources we, where we know that they're going to be most effective. So when we talk about where some property crime has come down, uh, last, uh, just a, a month or two ago, uh, we, as a result of the, the uh, break-ins that were occurring downtown, the smashing of several storefronts, we deployed significant resources in the early morning hours and the evening hours to combat that. That resulted in two arrests where we tied those individuals to a number of those break-ins. There were also 12 other arrests made. We also issued 12 citations. There were 48 verbal warnings, and we actually uh, conducted checks on 658 individual businesses and actually found some security concerns with some of those businesses. We were able to go back and make some recommendations for improved security plans for some of those businesses. Um, we had a tar several target uh, operations where we targeted chronic shoplifting. We were getting a lot of complaints from some of our big box stores. Uh, that they were getting hit particularly hard. So we were able to uh, organize, put several operations together on uh, box stores on South Tunnel Road, Swannanoa River Road, Brevard Road, and Smoky Park Highway. And uh, out of those operations, 73 arrests were made. There were 127 to total charges, 33 of which were felonies, but we also recovered some meth, fentanyl, ecstasy, and along with a, a firearm. So those operations, very successful and really we're targeting the, the chronic shoplifting in some of those locations. Uh, if you remember, we reported uh, last year of the rise in aggravated assaults because it was a problem with our crime data last year as well. And we uh, identified maybe six to seven different areas where aggravated assault was very prevalent. And one of those areas included our downtown area. So in September, from September to October of last year, we ran a, a month-long operation where we just were highly visible. Uh, there was heavy enforcement action, even for some minor violations. And that resulted in 60 arrests, 172 citations, and 277 verbal warnings. But what we also saw was a dramatic decrease in aggravated assault in the downtown area. Some of these other operations, particularly the B&E operation that we ran a few months ago, that is now carried over into January, February, and March of this year, 
And what I can tell you is once again, while we were running these operations, we were seeing, again, a dramatic drop in aggravated assault. So we know uh, our data is reliable. We're using it to the best of our, of our ability to put our resources in place where they're needed most. And we see that when we are there and when we have the ability to be proactive, we're also very effective. So we're hoping as this continues and, and this de these deployments continue, these operations continue, that we'll see those violent crime numbers come down throughout the city. But again, it really boils down to good data and having the resource and the ability to do it. So we were very effective in several instances. Homicides, um, really, since pr uh, 2014, have played, pl played fairly steady. Uh, there have been dips in, um, in some instances, rises. Unfortunately, in uh, 2022, we did see 11 homicides in our city, but again, the, the rise there is not statistically significant to what the overall trend is over the past decade. So again, unfortunately, it's an increase from 2021, but, um, and, and obviously all losses are terrible, but um, the numbers have not significantly risen, nor have they significantly declined. Over the past five years, there's 52 homicides that have been reported in Asheville. Uh, we are down currently 55% of our investigators and our detectives. However, despite those losses, our clearance rate is 63% in those cases, which I think is, is pretty darn good considering the national average in 20 and 21 is about 50% clearance rate on homicides. Obviously, we wish we could solve every single one of them. That's impossible, but we are trending ahead of the national average. I can also tell you in 2023 already, we've had three homicides and all three have been solved. Shots fired. Uh, when I arrived here in 2020, uh, we were at 652 calls of shots fired per year. This is an effort that's been ongoing for three years is to get these numbers down. Uh, the number of shots fired in the city is completely unacceptable. We have been targeting and working with our partners, both federally and locally and with the county, to get these numbers down. And you get these numbers down by taking the most violent criminals in the city off the street. And as we've been able to do that, we've seen the shots fired calls come down now two years in a row. So that is a very, very positive development in our estimation. That's the good news. The bad news is, unfortunately, when we talk about victims of gunfire, we, saw, uh, we did see a rise this year from 31 to 36. But again, we're much lower than where we were in 2020. So a little bit of good news, bad news there. The shots fired calls are down, but unfortunately, the number of people hit has risen over a year ago. As I've stated numerous times, what's driving our violent crime rate more than any other factor is aggravated assault. And again, we saw another big jump from 21 to 22, uh, a 21.8% increase in those aggravated assaults. And those aggravated assaults are basically assault with a weapon. When we get into our sex offense cases, particularly rape, there's very little proactive work uh, that can be done there. You can see these numbers across uh, the decade have been, you know, for the most part, that, that has stayed level. But again, that's, that's a very difficult crime to, to be proactive with. It's more about um, solving those cases when they do unfortunately occur. Robbery, uh, we, we've saw years where it's been much worse. Last year, uh, I would call that an average year if we could, if we could use that, uh, fortunately, uh, the number did not rise to what I would call a statistic uh, that's significant. But there was a slight rise from 2021, but again, less than 2020. So hopefully we can get that going in the other direction. Armed robbery, kind of the same thing. You can see the ebbs and flows over the course of time. And again, another slight rise, 20%, not slight, but 20% from 21 to 22 on armed robbery. 
So with that, before we move on to the next part, portion of our presentation, if you have any questions on crime in 2022 that I can answer for you. At your convenience, Chief, can you um, provide the demographic makeup um, of victims of violent crime? I believe those numbers are on our transparency dashboard, are they not? Or we were in the process of including that uh, on our transparency dashboard. We've got a crime analyst working on that, but we can get that information for you okay, thank easily. You. Yes. I just have a couple quick questions. Um, if I am a downtown business and my window is smashed in and my goods are stolen, am I a property crime or a robbery? That would be a property crime. Okay. So robbery is what someone entering the home while people are there or something? What's, yeah, I mean, okay. if you had a home invasion type situation okay. where you're physically okay. Thank at you. risk, yeah, that would um, be robbery. Really, my only question is, are you, this anecdotally in the community, I hear this, are you at all concerned that some people are not reporting crimes as many, as much as they used to, particularly property crime? Yes, we have heard that anecdotally. We Obviously, we can't create a statistic on that, yeah. but we have heard from members. Of, so that's why we're cautious a lot when we talk about the property crime coming down. Is it really coming down or is it going underreported? Same thing with shots fired. Right. The right. Shots fired, that, that's coming through the CAD system. So we know those 911 calls are coming in. But I'm saying but those people are the ones calling. that are reported because a lot of people hear gunshots yes. in their community and it's so regular yeah, or they and, don't yeah. get the response that they, they need. And so I they think, just don't make the call. Yeah, and I think you're right. But I think, too, that's always been a problem uh, where, where that's going underreported. So again, yeah, it's, it's difficult. All we can do is rely on our CAD data, that, that stuff that comes in where people are actually reporting. Are we, is it all being reported? Of course not, no it isn't. Can the number's always higher. Can you possibly go back to the property crime, crime slide? I think it was the third. I'm just astonished by these numbers. I wasn't able to see your meeting today, but I mean these are, these are four digit numbers. All the others were not. I mean, again, those those could be you know simple car break-ins, uh, a lot of shoplifting there. We do have a lot of big box stores, so all that is encompassed in that number. So this and is another, like yeah. every everything Walmart reports mm. everything. Yeah. Um, I mean, and when we look at a heat map of the property crime like this, it's like the mall. It's you know. The, it's going to be your big box retailers. Yeah. It's going to and they're going to report base, it. You know. Wherever there's heavy commerce, you're going to see property crime numbers, you know, much higher than in other areas, than perhaps a neighborhood area. Can I mean, I? there are actually communities, just to interject, where Walmart has such a high volume, they actually provide support for security because they're like their own generator of crime that has you to know, be managed. And, and, and again, with, mm -hmm. when you talk about underreporting, different corporations have different corporate policies on what they pursue. Does and we've been... So with certain uh, big box retailers, we have actually told them if, you know, where, where they would like to report, but then be reluctant to prosecute with our resources being what they are, if you're not going to prosecute, we're not sending someone out to take reports. And do, you know, this is another one of these areas where I wonder, you know, just with the traffic ticket concept where there's legislation pending right now to allow non-sworn officers to handle uh, traffic incidents that don't involve a uh, bodily injury. I mean, is this the kind of thing where if it could be outsourced to non-sworn personnel to handle the write-up of these incidents? I mean, unless they need it investigated or if they're just doing it to report for insurance or something, I'm not exactly sure what the yeah, need is. Yeah, I, I haven't really, I mean, that would have to be explored much deeper what that role would be. Mm -hmm. uh, the reality is, are you gonna prosecute? You, is your security system up to date? And is the person in custody or not in custody? And again, what, what you'll see with some retailers is they just don't care and it's acceptable losses. So. I get a lot of frustration from those, real, those, um, those storefronts actually. I hear that a lot. And I mean, I've been at Lowe's a number of times when I've seen just carts full of people, just, they just walk out the door and the policy in the stores don't follow them, it's dangerous. Right. So, but I guess my, so this property crime, can I go on the dashboard and drill down to some of this so I can, like, for my own knowledge, mm -hmm. exclude the Walmarts and the so on and get a better view? Of I or we could probably just, provide you it. more precise information, but on the dashboard, um, we would have to, you need a little bit of guidance on, on how to drill okay. down on that, but it can be done. For okay. Sure. 
And I guess to the mayor's point, I mean, I, I kind of had a similar thought. Is there some of that reporting that we could take off APD shoulders? And I guess that's kind of like the Well, bill, I mean, we do have that. We have our police to citizen yeah. online reporting. Right. And yeah. But what we see is, again, whether it's uh, just some are technology savvy, some don't have the access to technology. Uh, well, now that's interesting. And some won't yeah. just take the time to do it. So do we, we have, have the data? system in place for the report. Do we have data of whether or not it was reported that way? Oh, yeah, we have, we, uh, and it's frustratingly low. Okay, and I just, because there's an opportunity, right, to improve that for the businesses, they do that instead of calling for officers. I'm just wondering training. how. And we have yeah. advertised that, and we have put okay. that out repeatedly, and it just, unfortunately, the system is underutilized. And, and I wonder we'll if that's We'll just keep like, putting it out there, yeah. that's all we can do. Sure. And maybe business community organized groups would care. Okay, I, I'll end with my questions, but I found that really helpful, thank you. Sure. Also, just share before we move on to the next one um, that in the Environment and Safety Committee meeting, we talked, we had this presentation and witnessed some depth, and particularly we all expressed a lot of concern about the trend with aggravated assault. That's scary. That's scary for a lot of people. I hear from people who are who are nervous, and um, we asked staff to come to us, and we're going to talk next month about what's the twelve month plan. What what strategies are we going to be doing? We know we're going to go look at hiring retention next in the presentation and we know that we struggle with that and that that's a problem and we aren't just sitting on our hands. We're gonna be really, really focusing on what we can do to address this and all the other concerning things in crime. So more from environment and safety uh, as the spring moves forward. And after uh, the presentation this afternoon, because of some of the questions that were asked, uh, I went back to our analysis to get a little bit more information. And when it comes to aggravated assaults, one in four are domestic related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we were able to drill down on those numbers a little bit further. Yep. So we we are we are working on this. This is not we are not just looking at these numbers and going, oh well, we don't have staff. We are gonna get creative and we are going to do our jobs, keep people safe. And again, what we do see, and we saw it through some of the operations that we ran, even though we weren't running an operation to curb aggravated assault, we were running operations to deter break-ins downtown, but just that physical presence in that particular district, aggravated assaults came way down. For the downtown. Uh, so we know, what we do know is presence, or the, the sense of omnipresence does work. It doesn't solve all crimes, it doesn't deter all crimes, but there is definitely a correlation to if we are in the area, that aggravated assault number seems to go down. So we'll continue to test that theory. And I, I wanted to touch on the, uh, the last bullet in the key takeaways that the chief talked about is that public safety is our responsibility in terms of the collective, the community's responsibility, and in particular related to what you were just talking about in terms of aggravated assault and one in four is domestic violence. I mean, we need all of those other providers to help us in terms of preventing crime, because that's what we want to do. We don't always want to be reacting. Mm -hmm. We want to be preventing. Absolutely. And, and, and that's what we need, a lot of help from the broader community to help us with. Absolutely. We own ours. We know that we have got to do more, but we need more help as well yeah, with some of those other areas. Part of the conversation today, um, just because it's so important, I think, for us all to be kind of clued in is, you know, we, we had a presentation from uh, the parks director about our parks master plan. We heard from the police chief, we heard from the fire chief. We looked at all these and said, hmm, when we're doing a really amazing job with our community centers, is that crime prevention? I bet it is. You know, so looking at it broadly, oh, that just like you're saying, Deborah, this isn't just one department, there's a lot of services. When we have our street lights bright, that can be a crime deterrent. So we really want to be looking across the entire organization and to our community partners to make sure that this time next year, we see these bar charts going in the other direction, despite the struggle that we have with staffing. I, and I appreciate that. And I think there's a lot of things that contribute. Great education system, yes. great health care, yes. all sorts of things yes. um, contribute to lowering crime rates. Um, and the street light, I, we've been talking about street lights, I feel like, for a while. Um, it'd be nice, not now, but to hear how we're going to comprehensively deal with streetlights because we do know that that is a really important 
in, in our downtown and in our, out mm -hmm. in our community as well. And I, I mean, Chief, you kind of touched on this a little bit. I mean, you, you basically said when we, when we have an operation, not an operation, uh, we see this reduction in aggravated assaults, which is the primary driver of our increase in violent crime. And it kind of um, begs the question, is it, well, why don't we just operationalize that? Is there a way to do that? Um, it, it, again, crime moves. Uh, it, it doesn't stay stationary. Where we provide a, a heavier presence, where we're not, where we are not, we also see crime tend to go up if we ignore an area. And we did identify like six or seven really hot spots in town, and certainly we can't, you know, we don't want to just focus on one. You know, we, we have to move those resources around. So our, our problem always is how long can we sustain a single operation in a single area of town. And we certainly don't want to neglect other areas that are suffering the same uh, issues, especially when it's related to violent crime. So we want to, we can't be everywhere, but we're again trying to just strategically deploy. But when we move, we're moving to another area that's also affected. And again, a lot of times these, these plans are developed we're ready to go, we're ready to move on something, and then something bigger will come up, and then our attention gets diverted away. So, unfortunately, that, that's just uh, an extension of, our, of being down and not having the, the staffing where we could run more operations or just physically be present all the time, like when we had a downtown unit. So, you know, obviously that's the goal to get back to, but, while we can't get there, that doesn't mean we're not there or we're never there. We are kind of floating around, moving back and forth, and trying to stay ahead of it. Something that came up in the Environment and Safety Committee today that I was in, thought was interesting, and I heard um, staff speaking to that specifically rape was one to, that was hard to get to the, the root cause of the crime and get to prevention. But I also heard a conversation around, could we look at what the plan is? I don't want to see any intimate partner violence, but, and no amount of it is like, I'm not going to go to a neighbor that's, that's suffering through healing and say, well, you're on a number on a screen, there's data around this. Like, I think the community expects us to have a plan. So I think that what I was hearing is like, could we look at a strategy for addressing the root causes and prevention around some of these issues instead of just the numbers? And I think that would reflect what yeah. the community's asking for us. Yeah, I think that's what we're saying, and staff is going to start bringing to us. The first step of that is to look at the um, the goals that we co-created at our council retreat. So we came up with a list, and that was kind of in brainstorm mode. So staff is going to be synthesizing those goals, which shows things like crime prevention, root cause, as well as crime reduction, because we need we need all of those strategies to be addressed, and then look over what are we doing currently and what else can and should we be doing so we can get to that point of here's the plan team we're all rowing in the same direction towards that well, i also heard a question about demographics but when i have the i'm looking at the crime crime trends dashboard here and i have three options neighborhood selector crime type and report date if i'm missing something i don't have access to demographics but i know there's some reasons that some of them wouldn't be on there for victim anonymity yeah i mean Again, our dashboard is one of the most robust in the country as far as finding information. Can, can you find everything and break it down? Uh, I know we've got victim information and we've been building that portion of it out, but again, it takes time and it takes resources to do that. Uh, but when we, again, when we talk about root causes of crime and violent crime, they are what they've always been. Poverty and substance abuse. I mean, you're gonna find that at the top. Uh, there may be other factors uh, economic conditions, you know, so forth, but but that's where it's going to be, and and some of it is design, right? We heard today about safe street designs. We just had a cyclist <coughs> that um, lost their life due to an interaction with someone driving a vehicle, and our we have the second highest bike pedestrian accident ratio in the state. It's not good for business. It's not good for people who live here or visit, and poor people and vulnerable people are. Um, more at risk, but if we don't do our design of our neighborhoods or the way that we move, we, then we are knowingly allowing um, accidents to happen. And again, that's why we're working with our business community. We had a lot of contacts uh, over the last few months with crime prevention through environmental design. Mm -hmm. And 
you know, but of course there's, there's sometimes there's some pushback on those things as well. I also heard you mention poverty, and I think that's really important because when I'm looking at the trends up, and then I'm matching that with what I'm hearing about, the trend is up in tourism, up in housing costs. We're struggling to keep up with living wages for our own staff. Um, we're working on a place of belonging for our young people, but we're lacking solutions that are, we're competing with the attraction of illegal trade. Um, and I think we desperately need more of our occupancy taxes to address the root causes around housing, infrastructure, safe design, speeds for our roads, public services. I just, I don't see how we keep up and go, continue to go in this direction where everything is going up with solutions. And that, and that was obviously That's more of me. a global statement, mm -hmm. you know, not, not necessarily, but, and would require legislation and we keep beating that drum, which is true. We've got a... Anything else? Else? Wait, I don't really know if, yeah. <laughs> Where you want to hear about recruitment? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Captain Wolf. <laughs> don't make sure that. Sorry for those that had to hear this earlier. I will try to make this painless to give again, but in, uh, in disclosure of what we're doing, uh, in transparency of what we're trying to do with working with staff. Uh, within our executive team as well as within council to try to be competitive in the market. That was kind of the, the main piece of what we, you needed to hear from us. Uh, we've been tracking this uh, from my office for quite some time and where we're at. That's where most of that data comes from is what other cities are doing, what municipalities are doing within the state and within the nation. And so we're working to try to find where we fit in there. Unfortunately, folks are watching us do that too. Chief and I just attended a job fair that we'll talk about shortly where several other entities of police departments came to him and thanked him for the work he's doing with the city because that's getting attention and that's going to drive up their wages too. So with that, uh, we thank you for that, but we ask that you know you continue to, to work towards what, what we've put out there and what we're saying and we'll continue to give you that feedback. So right now we've had 10 officers uh, that are in their field training. Uh, we've reported on that before. They should, should complete in May. That is hopeful. Uh, unfortunately, this next section here, we no longer have five, we have four. Uh, this is one of the realities that we have shared of what has happened, but I also think it's a good opportunity to just show that it is not a reduction in standard in who we're hiring. Uh, the state still has a minimum, uh, and they must pass that, and unfortunately, we had one that failed. Uh, and we will move on and attempt to try to recoup that loss uh, as we push forward. Uh, but we still have four. Those are slated to graduate in July. They would then get to their field training in November. Uh, we are processing eight applications for that July. We have held off somewhat uh, for that Canton job fair that we were able to get into. We also attended one at the Ag Center. Uh, and when we're there, we're competing not just with other police departments. Uh, we, as we discussed in committee today, we're competing against private business and, and quite frankly, a trend across the nation for people not looking to get into this profession. I don't think there's any uh, secret there that this is not a profession that people are knocking at the door to get to. And so not only are we combating that piece of just getting people interested in the job, then we gotta get them interested in what they can make as far as pay and benefits with this job. Epic is a big piece of what we kind of asked for uh, early on when it came to seeing what we saw in the early stages of 2020 and 2021 about what we needed to do to get more visible. How do we attract people, not only just to the city, but to want to work within this city police department? Uh, Epic was obviously selected to help drive people to the website to see us and then to get them to apply. Uh, when they were launched in September, we then launched that digital campaign and we use uh, social organic content with these ads and we've we've reported on that before too and what those ads do are to drive the city police department in front of as many people as we possibly can you know our goal is to use all of those social media platforms to just get out in front and and that's what the hope is you'll hear see in a slide in a second just what that looks like from them from an analytical standpoint and from those on the committee heard me try to describe too we also tried to make it as understandable for those of us that are not as savvy in the world of what impressions and clicks and all that look like. So I will do my best to try to explain how that works. But since this inception, we've seen a, a large increase, as you can see, of 8,500 clicks to our website alone. We can track some things. We've tried to ask, ask them to track as much as possible for us so we can provide you that data. And then we've seen over 1.7 million impressions through these campaigns. Impressions are number of views. 
So that's what we're trying to get. We're trying to get in front of as many people as possible. Obviously, we want that to grab their attention to get them to seek out more information. That's getting clicks on those ads. We want them to take a deeper dive. We want them to look at what else can I get out of the city? Do I fit there? Is this for me? Uh, and so that's why Epic was so important, is to tell the story of what it's like to be an officer within the city, to give a little insight into what the city looks like. We want those to turn into conversions. As you can see, it's to really show in action uh, how interested are they. Will they fill out a form? Will they go to another page? Will they want to seek out what our benefits look like? Uh, we want to know all of that data. We also want to know if they're looking at these videos. Uh, is this working? Uh, do we need to continue, uh, as we've discussed with the committee at length, do we continue seeking advertising dollars in this area? If it's not working, we need to seek out other methods. And with that being said, we, we have not turned an eye away from older forms of campaign too. May that be billboard media, magazines, newspapers, those are still in play too. But what we have seen with this data is we don't get in front of many viewers as we would with what we've had. So you see video interactions and then those form fills. And we talked about the form fills a little bit in committee too, and that's whether or not they're actually seeking out more information from the city via the website. So do they want to know about the job? Do they have a specific question surrounding one of the benefits? Do they want to know what our hours of work looks like? That's, that's where they get that information and that's what we're seeing. And then uh, when we try to target a certain specific uh, audience, that's really what's happening to every one of us every time we click on buying something from Amazon and we leave it in our cart, you get five more of those popping up on your screen the next time. Amazon pays for that. They want to be back in front of you. And so that's a part of that digital marketing. They want to get you back flashed in front of your screen, and we're trying to do that too. If there's a police department that's going to pop up that's hiring, we want it to be us. So from an analytical standpoint, this is just kind of giving you a very quick down and dirty look at what Epic gives us that streams through when they get clicks. So you got search campaigns to display campaigns. Uh, this is all of those side boxes on your web pages to those that are on social media and if they're getting to our page from there. The events that you're seeing and those total numbers of views on our website, plus who's actually staying there, how long they stay on the page, do they get up to the top and actually click that, I want a job, or what does pay look like? And then we have those form starts. We also track how many people started to ask us a question but actually didn't get around to sending it to us. And so probably more data than you wanted to see, but we're getting all of this from Epic and it really gives us a true picture of what that piece looks like. So that was really quick. Uh, over, I think committee members got a whole lot more today. We had even some questions, and, and I'm open for those too. I'll try my best. The only thing I'd like to say, um, you did a great job uh, explaining you know, how you're going about with the recruiting. And I was just thinking of something that uh, when you were talking about the slides and the videos that you, sh that you use for recruiting, I was just wondering, do they use any advertisement just showing the beautiful mountains and and uh, it's kayaking and tubing and all the activities that I, I was just yeah I just it does, it does have all that that's what I'm saying okay I just wanted to make sure it, it did include that I think what Councilwoman Smith said is you need to spend more time in the webpage <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. okay I think so okay they, they did a, they did a really great job not only of what the city looks like but they did a great job depicting what some of our officers do not just in their job, but what yes. they do on their own and how they engage here that makes this Asheville their home. They did a great job of that. Thank you, I appreciate that. I, I will say, I think, I can't remember which graduating class it was, but I was struck by how many folks came here from around the nation and one of the drivers was, you know, this place is great, it's awesome, I wanna be here. I know it's hard to then retain you know, once they go through training and start for them to stay, um, so we got to help help you help them be able to to stay in our community. Well, and, and that's the goal. We we don't want to continue to have to speak about the number of resignations and what our loss looks like and what the percentage is that we are down. We we kind of want to move past and look at what you've spoken about and we even talked about in the committee, and that's the greater look of what the officers we have that are here. They're our recruiting driver. And then what we do on top of that, how we can aid them on our end from an executive team to, to council in giving them the tools that hook, what makes them want this place. 
And we have that at our disposal. We have a beautiful city. We have all of those things that people love about this place. We just have to, to fix that next step that is we've identified as why they're leaving and or they're not choosing this location. And I think we're getting closer. I think we have Thank to. You. Any other? Thank you. We have another presentation. Not as many slides. Uh, and this is, we're, I think we're honored to have both the chief of police and the fire chief uh, here tonight. It's a double so, chief night. Uh, chief Burnett, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Ms. Campbell. Uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, members of council, Fire Chief Scott Burnett, I'm very pleased to give you an update on our community responder pilot program. What I hope for each of you to take away from this presentation is that our AFD-led program is proactively supporting the existing efforts of not only Buncombe County, but the many other partners that do this work. And that our plan is being created to evaluate the best way to positively impact our community. I also want to make sure that, that we report out about the staffing of the program and how it's on track and uh, how we are working to finalize that initial plan and launch that pilot program. So the vision, the vision of the City of Asheville's Community Responder Program is to have an AFD-led multidisciplinary pilot program. And I want to um, emphasize the importance of that multidisciplinary piece. Our unsheltered community, they, they are experiencing a lot of overlapping challenges. And the unsheltered problem in our community affects everyone in our community. And so as big as the problem is, as big as the challenges are, we really need to have that multidisciplinary effort in order to, to move the needle. And so we want to make sure that it is a multidisciplinary program and, and not just the focus of, of one entity or one, one, one area of, of expertise. The reason that I, I want to um, highlight that is I've, I've been asked um, a number of times is um, how is this program different from Buncombe County's community paramedic program or how will it add to Buncombe County's community uh, paramedic program? And um, I, a, a, good, a good example is any, any very complex problem that, that affects everyone in the community always requires a multidisciplinary approach, especially when it comes to public safety, especially when it comes to community safety. An example is, is emergency management. Um, so emergency management is, is absolutely not a, a single disciplinary program that just the fire department does. Um, we, we include a multidisciplinary approach to that complex issue. Just our, our Office of Sustainability is heavily involved in our emergency management for good reason. Um, that multidisciplinary approach makes sure that we are not having an additive approach to a, a complex problem, but a, a force multiplier. And this is, this is um, very similar with this community responder program to assist folks in our community that are unsheltered, assist folks in our community that are experiencing addiction, that are experiencing behavioral health issues, and, and often those issues are overlapping. Our vision is also to support local businesses and residential areas by proactively addressing the concerns and quality of life issues before they escalate, before they um, become even more of an issue and a problem. And also to coordinate with Buncombe County to respond to the needs within the city of Asheville. So what we have been doing as we, we put together this plan for this pilot is we've been gathering information, uh, consistent check-ins with internal City of Asheville departments and external partners throughout our community, Buncombe County, um, uh, all, all of the, the folks who are involved in assisting our unsheltered community, uh, those who suffer addiction, those who, who suffer from behavioral health emergencies. Um, the recommendations from the National Alliance to End Homelessness, uh, gathering that information as they made their presentation recently, we had an inner city trip that many of you were part of uh, to assess the low barrier shelters in, in Raleigh and also in Carborough. And uh, as far as resources, uh, we looked internally within the fire department to find out how many of our firefighters would be interested. And we had 18 firefighters expressed interest 
and having a temporary assignment uh, in our community responder program. We also just graduated uh, 30 new firefighters, and so that, that helps with our staffing for this program as well. And so we're currently with our capital projects department looking into um, equipment, office space needs, as well as with our public works department for uh, vehicles. So what, what will these community responders be doing during the pilot? And I'll talk about the timeline here in just a second. But what we plan initially, and again, this is a pilot, and so we have the ability to be flexible. We have the ability to, to shift and um, uh, adapt to what the actual needs are. But we, we hope to have two person teams that work 12 hour shifts, seven days a week. Um, and we, we initially will match what Buckham County's outreach team is doing, their community outreach team, which is uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, we have that ability to, if the need needs to be earlier or later, or um, even more resources on a certain day, we have that ability by adding resources to this outreach effort. So these um, AFD community responders, they, they will be focused on outreach, education, and engagement. And that's uh, within our unsheltered community, within our business community, with, within our neighborhoods. And so they will be on the street, in neighborhoods, doing that outreach in our communities that of unsheltered people um, in our business communities, listening, educating, engaging, finding out what do we need to do to help move the needle? What are your needs? What are your needs when you're unsheltered? What are your needs when you're a business and you're impacted by um, our unsheltered um, issue? And uh, same with, with our neighborhoods. What, what can we do? What needs to be done? How can we assist and move the needle with this issue and the education being a huge, huge part of that. Prevention, I think, hi helps highlight why that multi multidisciplinary approach is so important. So over the last three years, the number of outdoor fires in the city of Asheville have, have more than doubled. Mm. And that increase is due to um, fires that occur within our unsheltered population. And fires are, are very cruel for anyone. They're particularly cruel for someone who is unsheltered. And so we, we have that subject matter expertise as an example on how to keep yourself warm safely, how to, to prepare your food safely. And what these folks will be doing is, is helping to um, address that significant issue that's, that's more than doubled in the last, last several years um, and, and uh, reducing those number of fires, particularly in our and sheltered community. Same thing with, with illness. Um, those who, who don't have access to shelter likely don't have access to health care either. And um, we are, the fire department and Buncombe County EMS is, is their health care. And um, we, we want to be able to do the um, prevention of those illnesses and injuries so that it's not a 911 call. They don't have to wait until their, their um, illness gets to the point where they have to be transported in an ambulance to get medical, medical care. Also, I think that um, with, with our unsheltered population, um, trespassing clearly is an issue that we hope to do some prevention work with. And if we have a relationship with somebody and they're in a place on somebody's property that that person doesn't want them to be, if we have that relationship and we can find somewhere safe that they can go to, then it doesn't escalate into a trespassing issue that the police department um, you know, obviously would, would need to deal with. So those are the types of prevention activities that we hope to, to perform. Connection and coordination. So as we are engaging and developing relations, continuing to develop relationships with our unsheltered community because we already have strong relationships. Uh, we work with them every day. Uh, making sure that, that we connect them with, with the resources that are out there. Um, that, that we are um, connecting them with uh, behavioral health resources out there. We're part of the, the Buncombe County's Behavioral Health Justice Coalition connecting them with resources uh, when they are suffering from addiction. So the next steps, uh, we're of those 18 folks that said they were initial, we're, we're gonna select um, four or five folks to staff the pilot program. They're gonna be reassigned. They won't have any other duties. They will be um, uh, completely dedicated to this program for, uh, during the duration of the pilot program. Uh, we're gonna finalize the plan and schedule and we're, we're doing training with uh, the Buncombe County programs to make sure that there's, that there's enough consistency as possible. And, uh, and then we're gonna launch that pilot program. So the, the tentative timeline 
is uh, we're going to have that outline of the plan complete by the end of this month, just in a couple of days. Implement it May 1st. Uh, compiling evaluation data from the, the first 60 days of the pilot uh, at the end of June, and then uh, report back out to um, environment safety and, and full council if, if necessary um, by the end of August. So just as in summary, uh, this is an AFD-led pilot program. Uh, we're going to be existing Buncan County's efforts. Uh, we're creating it. Oops. That's it. Oh, you lost me. That's fine. We're going to be uh, creating it to evaluate the best way to, to move the needle. And we are on track with our staffing and we're working to finalize the initial plan and launch the pilot program. So I'd be happy to answer any questions. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, could you give us an example of what uh, the position actually looks like? Like, how do you, when you're out there in the community, can people actually reach out to you? If so, how would they contact you? Uh, would you be getting any uh, leads from, I mean, calls from 911 that basically reach out to you? Or will you be having radios? Or just want to sort of get an idea because uh, if, if someone's having an issue where they don't really think it needs to be a police issue, just someone need, needing help, how would they reach you? What, how would Excellent you? question. Excellent question. And the answer is all of the above. And so currently those calls are, are coming in in a lot of different ways. We get, we get Facebook messages saying, hey, there's this issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, obviously calls go into 911. We get uh, phone calls on our business line. The police department gets phone calls on, on their business line. Uh, the uh, uh, Buncombe County gets phone calls on their business line. And so there's, there's a lot of different ways that the community connects with us when there is um, a, that need. So one of the things that we're going to be doing during that uh, education, that outreach, is, is doing that listening and finding out what is the best way. If you're unhoused, if you're unsheltered, what, what is the best way for you to, to, to reach out and, and get some help? And I think, I think we'll have a much better answer to your question towards the end of this pilot. And um, in the meantime, though, what we hope to do is the proactive piece is going to um, not require folks to, to need to call us because we'll be there. We'll be there and uh, they, they know that, that we're there and um, um, you know that those, those relationships with our unsheltered community, with our uh, neighborhoods, with our business community, uh, we're going to be there every single day and so those will be the opportunities for folks to, to talk. But all of those existing channels that are used today, um, it, our, our firefighters will carry radios, they will be uh, fully connected to our 911 system and uh, when those calls come in, whether it's through Facebook Messenger or through a 911 call, we'll be able to, to get to folks that are in need. But there's not, there's not any uh, current well, yeah. uh, you know, number that somebody should call or anything like that yet. Okay, thank I, you. I think it's a really important question though because you know, for those of us that have gone on the ride along with the county community paramedic mm -hmm. program, it has been a real challenge to figure out with our existing 911 system should there be a non-emergency number? Should it be designated? Should it be distributed publicly? Or should all the calls just go through 911? Because so often it's not possible to clearly understand the situation um, well enough to direct the response. So you, everybody goes out and then whatever team is the best fit for that mm -hmm. response stays. This is for the more the emergency response and how they're um, delegating the resources. Because if your team's out there too, and community paramedics are out there, I'm sure there's gonna be a learning curve of figuring out, do we both need to be at this call? Are you guys at this call? Are we at this call? Is, how is this call different? And then what are the, you know, they're doing proactive work as well. They've got, you know, they come on shift and they've already know they're gonna go see this guy at six o'clock because he need, they already had a predetermined appointment with him. So they have that mixed in with the emergency response. So I'm sure it'll be, well, with any of these new programs, it's, it's much more, um, complicated when you watch the actual administration of it on the ground. I think ideally it would be great if we work toward a system where um, residents and shop owners and folks like that did, did know kind of exactly if there were gonna be non-emergency numbers that were available for different resources, what that list was and what, which one they're supposed to call and when. And I think for right now, it's just been determined it's too difficult. Yeah, too, too early to tell. To, to, yeah, just correct. call 911 and they'll figure out mm -hmm. who, who needs to be there. Yeah. 
And, and this isn't so much for you, but, but, but your team will encounter it, and I'm sure already has. But we have a lot of questions in our community around um, mental health crises. We, we are seeing it happen in our community. We are watching folks experiencing a mental health crisis in real time. Um, and there are a lot of questions about who do you call? What happens? What is, and so I'm not expecting you to answer this. The city doesn't um, have a direct role necessarily in mental health crises unless it's an emergency or someone's um, physically in danger. And I've only been able to understand the tip of the iceberg about everything from involuntary commitment to the county's BHUC facility, which they've now funded to get up and running 24 seven again, but it isn't yet. Um, and so at some point, I'm kind of looking at you, Deborah, but um, I, I think it's important for us to at least get a really good understanding of how that system works in our community because I, people are reaching out to us for sure. about those questions. They're not reaching out to the direct providers of those services, and we need to have a better level of understanding of how that works so that we can A, explain it to people, and B, understand what our role in is, is in it and what we can do better um, to, to support that system. And, and, and a lot of the work that AFD staff has been doing is actually working with those providers. So as you just said, uh, Mayor, we can get an understanding of number one, who are the service providers, and quite frankly, who should we call right. as, as our uh, employees are out in the field and we notice and come upon uh, someone who is having um, a crisis. And um, so, yes, ma'am, we will, we will provide that information possibly as part of the analysis of our, when we launch, we want to have a lot of specificity about what our role is going to be and when and who do you call and all of that information. Um, we got about 30 more days in order to, to get all of that information uh, compiled before we launch. Um, but we, we definitely know that it's a need. Absolutely, and I, and I think the important uh, message that, that we can continue to, to push out is, because it happens already, if, if, if someone in our community has a problem, they're, they're already calling um, for, for that help. And so this is an effort to, to find out when that call comes in, however it comes in, what what can we do as, as a city to make sure that we're matching them with the best help possible? If somebody has a, a water leak, we get those calls. And if somebody's house is on fire, we get those calls too. And um, so, so it's, it, we're, we're not um, unfamiliar with trying to, to triage and navigate the, those things, but you're exactly right. Well, this, this is um, a path to a, a better route for people to get that, that care. I just wanted to say thank you um, to you and your team um, for exploring this new, it's not so new response, right? Because the county's doing it, but so is Durham. So I had like, after I watched the Environment and Safety Committee today, I had a, a series of five questions that I think are linked, and some of them I might be able to answer today. I hear we're planning to roll it out in May and June. Mm -hmm. What are the 12 hour shifts? Because I know there's gonna be some folks who are saying, focus on the late night, but there's also needs early morning. Yeah, so what, what we're hearing, so, uh, you know, Buncombe County has the two that are on duty that, that do outreach, and they need, they need capacity. What we uh, continuously hear from, from Buncombe County is their, their efforts are on response. Uh, they, they don't have much capacity right now to do any of the engagement or outreach. And so, but what we're hearing from them is, is what is working best right now for them is 9 a.m. until 9 p.m. And so we're going to start with that, with that ability to be very flexible. And so as we realize that, hey, there is, there is a greater need, and now that we have additional capacity, we, we can um, overlap one another and, and have that early morning, have that late evening. Um, and when, uh, you know, fortunately the, the, the weather is, is getting warm, but once it gets cold again, those late evenings will be even more important uh, to make sure Code Purple, we get people to shelters and stuff like that. And so um, I think the key is, is um, um, we are not uh, static with, with that schedule. We, we definitely have the, the opportunity to flex to match the need. I, I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded like outreach to identify needs is the primary objective, but I also heard specifically from you, Deborah, um, objectives around 
literally, quote, surveillance and boots on the ground. So can we speak a little bit about the position we're putting our staff in to do that when there's, let's be honest, we're like kind of missing the network of where we would send people if they're not in the right place to be. Chief, did you want to? Yeah, absolutely. So just so, so I understand your question, what, what would those boots on the ground be doing? Well, the, the words that were used were boots on the ground and surveillance. And if mm -hmm. those are primary objectives, I just, I, I'm trying to understand how that fits into the role of community responder. Well, I, I think that the terminology of surveillance is we are going to be out on the streets uh, looking and um, an environmental scan yeah, right an environmental scan or surveying mm -hmm. uh, conditions particularly within our downtown but also potentially in other parts of the community to see if there is someone in crisis and we again are trying to do this prior to those situations escalating to the point where a business owner or an employee can't get into the place that they need to get into or access to or and more importantly it's for that individual to be able to be connected to to help if there is if there are any uh, people within our uh, employment uh, that know how to address some of these issues it is afd mm -hmm. and it is the police department and those are the folks that we are asking to lead this initiative okay well that kind of is connected so um, with those being the primary objectives, it sounded like the primary difference, what I heard today, earlier today, was that our pilot versus Buncombe's is they're incorporating homeless outreach and opioid or substance response, and that we don't necessarily tend to focus on those issues in this pilot. Yeah, so, so we, we already do that, as you know, and so we will absolutely continue to, to focus on that. I think what we bring to the table with that multidisciplinary approach is very similar to our emergency medical services system right okay. now. And so um, cities um, that are inside a, a county, so a county has a, a level of, of good service that it provides to all county residents. And, and then cities that um, have um, densely populated areas will add services on top of that to, to be a force multiplier, not to be additive. And so that, that's exactly what it is here. So as an example, Buncombe County, by general statute, provides emergency medical services to county, all county residences. We, we provide also emergency medical services, not, not just to duplicate or just to even be additive to what Buncombe County does, but to be a force multiplier. They, they literally could not get folks to the hospital without the fire department's role. We, we also could not. And so similarly, we're, we're um, the multidisciplinary approach would focus their their uh, employees that are doing the street outreach, not the community paramedics that are, are focused heavily. As you know, you've done ride-alongs with them with the um, on the uh, post overdose response and the medication assisted treatment. Um, we we would not be doing medication assisted treatment. Uh, we're, we're not paramedics, and so the but the two EMTs that they have that do the street outreach and transport folks in a van. They're doing that transport they're not able to do outreach and so that's where you know we can come in and, and do that and having that multidisciplinary approach um we, you know the, the skill sets and the subject matter expertise that we have and, and i use fire as, as an example of, of several would be where we're you know we would bring additional um horsepower to the table so so i guess um Thank you for that force mm -hmm. multiplier understanding i'm just hearing that we're adding more tools to the toolbox and that's sure. awesome yes. what i don't yeah. want us to do is not imagine that we might see that we're actually not able to meet the gap and we actually should after this pilot expand the community paramedicine program with the county um, but also i just want to make sure that we have the right tools and training and i know that you're going to do that for our staff sure. i trust that yeah. i just i think it would be unfortunate if our community is like we see serious crises around <laughs> mental health behavioral health and substance use and then we have this opportunity to meet people where they are but we, we have to make sure we provide the critical training. Most of um, So I think that's going to be really important. There was something, the last thing that showed up in the um, slide, and it was around commercial and residential areas. And, and this is just me sharing where I'm at and also so maybe the public can follow along. There are people who live in our commercial areas. Downtown is a neighborhood, yep. right? And we know that. And so I was thinking about that um, all over our city, there's all kinds of people with different abilities, different levels of access to healthcare and housing, who have safety needs. And I just wonder, 
when I think about the National Alliance to End Homelessness, it's just, it was a reminder to me that we have to do all the parts. Because if we send our staff who are new and they've got this new training and we're gonna send them on this pilot and then we don't have an emergency shelter, then we're really just asking y'all to move people around and that adds to sleep deprivation and creates more crisis and more stress. So I haven't forgotten that this is just one part of the puzzle and thank you for helping me understand it better. And the PIAC subcommittee on shelter space continues its work and um, I'll share with you yesterday we toured the uh, Salvation Army uh, facility downtown and they have rooms filled with ready beds that are not filled because they don't have the staffing capacity and the funding for staffing. So definitely been a really um, educational process and I think we'll have some good recommendations coming from the subcommittee on that point. Okay, well, this concludes our, our presentation. And just one comment uh, at the Environment and Safety Committee meeting, uh, Deputy Ch Fire Chief um, Patrick Crudup did the presentation. Unfortunately, he had a conflict, so he was not able to come tonight, and the chief filled in for him. So yeah, and thank you, did a very And he job. would have done a much better job. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's, I, think. I wanted to share just one broad observation and you can sit down I'm not going to ask anything thank you for your time um, and really maybe it's a kudos and appreciation for the city manager but I know I've only been on this council for two years and many of us that ran were running on this idea that the city and the county needed to partner on more initiatives yeah. needed to work together be together better and I was just thinking throughout these presentations that we're doing so much with the county um, whether it's housing community responders reparations all these things and I, I think we just lost Chief Zach, but um, I was wondering, just kind of an out loud thought, if perhaps there is room for greater partnership in policing in that way, if the county and the sheriff's department might be able to help support our policing. And I was just gonna put it out there, I know we lost the chief and I don't need a response, but if we're doing so many great partnerships and we have this shortage, I wonder if that's an opportunity. Funny you should mention that. <laughs> that's going to sound like the mayor. Yeah, we, do, we do have a meeting coming up to explore those opportunities um, this week. I'm happy to be there if available. Right. Any, do you have any other questions? No, just a, a thank you and an observation. I mean, it's really incredible how much partnership is going on, and it was simply non existent mm -hmm. several years ago. So thank you to everybody for all their efforts on that. Uh, good, good evening again for the third time, uh, Mayor and Council, <laughs> Jay Dundas, uh, Capital Projects Director, uh, and in this capacity today serving as the uh, Administrative Liaison for the Independent Review Committee. This uh, presentation today uh, will report out on the activities to date um, and provide the 30-day update uh, on, the, on the group. Uh, key takeaways for this uh, presentation are the committee is making good progress and should be on track to meet the 30-day timeline for delivery of the final report. Uh, the committee is principally working in um, three areas, which include communication, uh, water system, uh, and then emergency response um, and operations. And then delivery of the final report tentatively scheduled for the end of May uh, with council presentations in uh, June. I uh, just wanted to highlight a few sections of the of the resolution, 2010 resolution, which will be highlighted today. Um, uh, the uh, membership, the report out for the 30 days, and then also the, the final report uh, on the, with a 90-day uh, deadline. Again, just want to recognize the members, of, the nine members of the committee. Um, we have, uh, the, they have thrown themselves into the activities uh, and the investigation of, of the uh, the event uh, that took place over between Christmas and New Year's and past New Year's, um, and so are very involved and, and interested in, in providing the, uh, the findings and recommendations that are of the expectation for the final report. Um, subcommittees, as I mentioned in the key takeaways, include communication, focus areas being internal and external uh, communications. Water systems, uh, they're focusing in two areas with related to water system, that would be the treatment plant operations and then also the transmission and distribution system operations. And then again, um, emergency response and the operations uh, associated with those activities. Um, 
So 30 days, you know, again, this goes back to January 10th, the council's uh, uh, appointments. Um, but from February 20th, the committee kicked off, uh, had a, uh, a meeting where almost all members were able to attend uh, in person. We had a couple that had to uh, pr participate remotely. But it was, that, it was uh, intended to be a, uh, a kickoff meeting to get inter introductions made and, and uh, kind of establish a, a path forward. Uh, since then, the committee and the subcommittees, uh, subcommittees have been, again, addressing those focus areas, have been working to collect information uh, via individual interviews or uh, data requests uh, to be able to provide a, uh, a basis for moving forward in their investigations uh, and, uh, and then also trying to create those paths forward so they can be efficient in trying to achieve that 90-day deadline. Uh, March 1st, we had a uh, roles and responsibilities meeting uh, to kind of just really clarify all of the, uh, what all of the participants in the activities, and you'll see that uh, uh, there are others, the, the committee is the, the focus, and they are the group to, performing the work. Uh, there is support services for them, and I'll go through that a little bit in a minute. Uh, the committee uh, had a check-in meeting prior to this, prior, you know, to, to check in to make sure that they were comfortable with the 90 days uh, to uh, address any ideas of, of needing to uh, make any requests for additional time, that was not the case, and, and certainly feel like they're uh, capable of achieving this uh, expectation in the 90-day deadline. Uh, so looking forward, obviously today is an update to council, and um, May, uh, May 30th would be the tentative delivery date for the final presentation. Again, subcommittees' activities are, high, are kind of outlined here. Um, interviews of the broad range of stakeholders, internal and external, um, collection and analysis of data from the water system operations, normal and through the event, uh, and then further investigation into that, and then developing plans that will allow them to appropriately analyze the data um, and to provide their final report. Additional support staff, as I'd mentioned earlier, include uh, uh, myself and Beth Beekel, who's the uh, AFD business manager. Uh, we have been hoping to provide connections uh, with the, uh, between the committee and, and any kind of resources they need in, internally. Um, and that's also, um, and then also the, uh, the, we have several uh, consultants that we are currently working with or, or are planning to work with. KTO Strategies is providing coordination and facilitation for the group. Um, report generation and the technical assistance is being provided by McGill Associates. And again, we are working currently with Hazen, um, formerly Hazen and Sawyer, uh, to uh, analyze some, some uh, system modeling. Uh, they've, they've got the model, uh, they, they've re most recently processed the model, so the committee had asked if they could uh, run some scenarios with regard to the uh, conditions uh, at the time of the event and, uh, and try to help the, support their in analysis. 90-day uh, reporting deadline, target again is May 30th, and uh, there will be an in-person presentation, the findings and recommendation by City Council at the first available meeting in June. So uh, if, if, if that's in the early June, uh, sometimes we only have one meeting during the summer. So it may be at the end of June. That, that presentation will not be from me, that will be from the committee members. Uh, key takeaways again are just the uh, committee is making good progress. They're really active right now um, uh, in, in their committee and in, in their subcommittee work as well. Um, They're working in the three areas that I identified um, and have uh, high expectations for delivering the port in the, in the, at the end of May. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I have a question for Brad, I think. I'm hearing a lot of concern about these not being public meetings. And I, and I want to own that, like, during the water outage, that was also the public's concern. So matching lack of public information with lack of public information, I think, has given folks uh, some heartburn, including me. Um, if we are, if they're dealing with like really sensitive information, like personnel information, wouldn't they just be able to use a closed session? And I'm honestly really surprised that not having public meetings isn't more of a liability. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Councilwoman Rowney. That is something that was at the heart of the discussion initially in, in the formation of this particular body in order to provide the service that we hoped it would give. Uh, as we went through and determined the scope of the work that this particular commission was going to undertake, 
it became quickly apparent to uh, city staff that in order for them to effectively review what happened, they needed to have full and complete access to all of the records associated, not just with the event, but the city's water system as a whole. Currently, North Carolina law actually prevents some, a lot of the information around our water system uh, due to its uh, existence as a critical piece of infrastructure. There is federal law, state law around this that essentially says you must keep that out of the public eye in order to maintain the security of those particular systems. In order for us to navigate around that limitation, in other words, if we had a public meeting, we would not be able in each of those meetings to give access to the commission members all of this material that we felt was absolutely essential for them to have. Uh, so it was determined that the best format in order for them to be able to do their job effectively was to allow them to serve as a task force as opposed to an advisory body to this uh, commission, which is not a public body, not subject to the open meetings laws, but to balance that by ensuring that anything that they actually report out is reported not just in a written opinion, but given to this body publicly in an open meeting. We understand certainly that there is more than a little public interest in this and we wanted to uh, ensure the public that any final opinions coming out of that body would not just be presented at, at an update like this, but more comprehensively uh, to this commission, both in written and oral form. But we truly believe that due to the current laws limiting the public access to many of the materials that this body needed, the only way for them to have full and complete access and comprehensive uh, ability to analyze the situation was for them to uh, do so in a non-open format. I hear that and we also voted to appoint their members so we can call it a task force or a committee which we do in this presentation um, and I think that it's an ultimately a missed opportunity even if we just provided the protection of every single meeting being a closed meeting <laughs> it would still be noticed and it would have some legal protection but also some documentation that their meetings happened and some basics of what happened so those meetings could be reviewed later so I, I'm, I, once again, I'm still surprised that we're like risking that potential liability. Thank we, you for the clarity. We do, and your, your sentiments are well taken. Uh, and, and I would point out, in North Carolina, the ability to go into closed sessions would uh, include the ability to discuss these particular sensitive information, but it, it must be somewhat surgically applied. And one second they could be talking about that and the next minute talking about something that is not a viable closed session. So we, we felt unless they were constantly staffed with legal counsel, uh, that it would be highly difficult for them to navigate those conversations to be able to come in and out of closed session necessary to not violate those restrictions on the opposite end where they're in closed session. Uh, it, it's something that, again, we, we gave quite a bit of thought to and tried to err on the side of giving the commission as much information as possible. That is a disappointing answer, though I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry, I have to bring the rest over. Any other questions? Um, have we like gained any insights yet? I mean, like I know it takes a while to formulate and share. There's still a lot so of data, like data collection and a lot of analysis right now, um, and, and so I would say that there's really no. Uh, findings or direction at this, at, at this but point. But we're on track for that 90 yeah. day. Yes. I know this is a lot of work. I know that um, pulling this together is a lot of work and um, that doesn't surprise me, you know, like there's a lot of work to get to your findings. So I look forward to that really, really do. Any other questions? Thanks so much. Thank you. That concludes the manager's report, right? <laughs> well, actually, it wasn't a part of the manager's report. Okay. That was a separate agenda. Okay. I'm sorry. That was under presentations and reports. You're right. That was not under the manager's report. Okay. Public hearing. Uh, public hearing. Our first public hearing is a public hearing to consider the conditional zoning of 283 Merriman Avenue from Institutional District and RM8 Residential Multifamily Medium Density District to Institutional District slash conditional zone to allow the existing surface parking to be used for office and other uses that are allowed by right in the institutional district. Will Palmquist is gonna tell us about that. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, members of council. Uh, Will Palmquist with Planning Urban Design. I'll be presenting 
This conditional zoning petition uh, for the property um, known as 283 Merriman Avenue, uh, the site of the former Brookstone Baptist Church. Uh, this aerial imagery uh, gives you an idea of the site layout of the property um, located at the corner of Merriman Avenue and Annandale Avenue and backing up against Henrietta Street. Uh, you can see the church buildings um, in the southwestern corner, parking lots to the north and the east, and a, a very small uh, one-story uh, former residential building in the southeast corner of the site. The existing zoning is a combination of institutional and residential multifamily medium density, RM8. Uh, that's kind of a legacy of uh, the church buying property along Henrietta Street and demolishing um, single family houses, uh, which then retain the RM8 zoning. Um, so that's the existing zoning. Uh, what's being proposed in this conditional zoning is that the existing institutional zoning would remain and the rear of the site would be rezoned to institutional uh, conditional, and that would have some conditions about the types of uses and so on and so forth. The future land use of the site is as well split between a combination of traditional corridor on the front and then traditional neighborhood in the rear. Uh, no change is recommended at this time. I'll get into some of that nuance uh, a little bit later in this presentation. The proposed site plan is uh, relatively basic. It doesn't really have any um, full construction drawings as that's not really the intent of this conditional zoning. Essentially what's being proposed is that the existing church buildings uh, would remain um, and, and whatever would happen in that building would happen by right in the existing institutional zoning district there. The surface parking that's currently zoned RM8 would be uh, rezoned with the condition that it would stay surface parking. Uh, it's not currently an allowed use in the RM8 district. Uh, the fact that the site is split zone kind of adds more ambiguity to that. Um, it's not handled very well in our zoning ordinance, so the rezoning would, would kind of clean up that potential um, conflict um, in that zoning. And then that very small one-story um, single-family house structure on Annadale Avenue would be um, permitted for some uses within the institutional zoning district, but not all of them necessarily. So this is kind of that condition uh, that's worked into the Exhibit E project conditions document about limiting the surface parking lot to um, remain to serve um, the, the uses, other uses on the property. The one-story residential structure would be permitted to um, have uses in it that would align with residential, daycare, offices, clinics, financial institutions, health and fitness facilities, and studios, galleries, or workshops. So at the March 1st Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, the commission did not recommend approval of the rezoning. Uh, they made a motion to approve, which failed by a vote of one to six. A lot of that uh, discussion and concern that was brought up at the meeting really revolved around the fact that the rezoning would remove residentially zoned land near an existing neighborhood, and also that the rezoning did not include detailed site plans for what is being proposed at the property, um, such as with the more traditional conditional zoning application. Regarding the uh, rezoning's uh, consistency with the city's comprehensive plan, the rezoning would be um, consistent with the traditional corridor future land use designation, which is described as a roadway with a large variety of land uses, including commercial office and residential. And the rezoning would be only partially consistent in staff's opinion with the traditional neighborhood future land use designation, uh, which is described as a diverse range of housing types and an intersecting street pattern with cross streets forming blocks. And that commercial uses will not will be inappropriate in a traditional neighborhood with the exception of uses compatible within a residential context, including homestays, bed and breakfast inns, and appropriately designed neighborhood centers. Um, so the recommendation here, you know, oftentimes with when there is a mismatch between the proposed zoning and the future land use, we could amend the future land use map to um, be more compatible in the future. Staff feels like, um, you know, keeping it the way it is is beneficial for a couple of reasons, one of which is that it kind of adds some protection and a, a long-term buffering between the um, 
the uses along Merriman Avenue and the residential neighborhoods. So while this rezoning um, is being recommended for approval by staff in the future, if another rezoning came forward um, and then we changed the future land use at this stage in the game, that incompatibility could be present and something that maybe is not appropriate um, could be allowed in the future. Also feeling that the uh, number of uses that have been limited in the project conditions align better with that idea of appropriately designed neighborhood centers. So um, staff feels there, there is some compatibility around that aspect of the rezoning. The rezoning supports a number of goals in the city's comprehensive plan, including to encourage responsible growth by prioritizing growth and development within designated growth areas, to promote great architecture and urban design, to enhance placemaking by promoting adaptive reuse as means of conserving materials, history, and embodied energy in buildings, and to enhance parking management strategies by considering zoning strategies that locate surface parking areas to the rear of buildings in identified innovation districts and along transit supportive corridors. Uh, therefore, staff recommends approval of the proposed conditional zoning with the attached Exhibit E project conditions. And that concludes my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions. I'm hearing that one of the reasons that planning and zoning didn't support this is that they, there's not a plan to really review. Is, am I getting that right? That's uh, part of it. So yeah, for a traditional conditional zoning application, we'd have full, um, full plans um, for the conceptual review. Uh, this was more of a way to um, have the applicant ensure to the public that, you know, as opposed to a straight rezoning to institutional, um, which could, you know, open, open the possibilities wider than what would be appropriate in this case. The fact that what's being proposed or considered in the future at the church building would be allowed by right in the institutional zone, which is what part of the property is already zoned, um, kind of uh, is, is the reason that this is a little bit of a different kind of conditional zoning in that regard. And that is one of the things that came up in our um, budget preview on Thursday is the potential for adaptive reuse. What is the trend going to be as folks look to repurpose some of these buildings that have historically been used for faith communities to gather? And is it precedent setting? I am a little bit concerned that we would have precedent setting for not having a plan and supporting something that didn't get through PNZ. Um, can you tell me, if, when I'm looking at like the community benefits of doing this with kind of moving into a murky area, what would be the impact on um, tree canopy? Would we see it? Would it stay the same? Would it be less? Would it be more trees at the end of the day? Um, I think ultimately we'd probably have more trees on site at the end of the day. Um, what's probably going to happen, assuming um, either the rezoning um, is approved or there's another way forward for some use of that property in the future, is that um, the site will have to come into full compliance with the UDO um, if the building value is increased. Is the, if the proposed work increases the building's value by over 75% and or other criteria are met, then the UDO requires things like street trees, parking lot landscaping, a lot of, um, yeah, the, the existing conditions is, is from older zoning codes that had very minimal uh, like parking lot uh, canopy um, requirements. So they'd have to bring up the code in that regard. They'd have to meet the tree canopy preservation standards, either through retention, fee and lieu planting. So, um, ultimately, um, if the project happens later down the road as a by right development, then it'd have to come to compliance with the, with the UDO. So I'm hearing the other thing that's um, given folks pause is that we would be considering moving from residential zoning to non-residential zoning. And I get that. Um, I'm going to ask this for, because it's a conditional zoning, and I ask every time, is there a plan to install solar to help us partner towards our carbon reduction goals? I do not believe so. That's not something that it's could consider that down the road, though. Right? Um, no, I would not discuss that. Um, it's really something that could be considered as, as the project moves forward. Let the applicants speak to that more if they'd like as well. Thank you. Can I make a clarifying question or comment? It's probably Brad here. Because I think um, it's a little concerning that P and Z also thinks this, but I've, I've heard this several times. But my understanding is legally, conditional zoning requests are not required to submit designs. I know in the past it has appeared this way because we often get them. 
And then when we have situations where we have not been provided them and we tend to say, hey, what's wrong here? But it's actually not a requirement, correct? Yes, that, that's absolutely correct. And it's, it's in many ways very similar to a straight rezoning yeah. where you are simply taking one particular zoning category and changing it to another uh, without any definitive site plan or use. That's actually historically a much more common way to rezone. Yeah. Uh, but oftentimes, if a site plan is known, you will see that fully developed plan, but it is not a legal requirement. So, so, to, so for this project, the only thing we're being asked to rezone is this back Strip, yeah. parcel. I'm looking at the screen where it's showing, and you've got the map there. <laughs> you overshot oh, the it. Blue. The blue. <laughs> go, if you go forward a couple more. Yes. yes. There you go. Nope. Or no, no, no one more. Back. Yeah. It's the blue that, Correct. so when you were asking about solar panels, I mean, my, what they're saying is they're just going to leave it. Oh, yeah, there's, it is. yeah, but you can put solar panels on. Oh, lots. well, I mean, it's, and it's got shade trees all around it. I mean, I, and it's, yeah. it's sunk down. I mean, I, I, yeah, I'm, a whole but, project. okay, I, I, but if we did do this conditional rezoning for this, just this piece, if in the future, someone said, we want to, um, you know, level the existing building on the rest of the parcel, which is a church and offices, if, and we want to just propose a, a new uh, development that complies with the existing zoning, which is institutional, would they be able to use the entire site, including the blue area, and just meet the buy right requirements for institutional? No, um, they would have to retain the surface parking that's shown in blue here. So basically, the this conditional zone would kind of lock in that rear section of the property as only being parking and then that one um, smaller building, essentially. Uh, they could do anything by right in the institutional in the other portion, but... So can you, can you just explain from a pragmatic standpoint why the conditional rezoning is necessary for the transfer of ownership and the continued use of the structure, which doesn't violate the existing zoning uh, on the rest of the parcel. Sure. Um, so regarding, there's kind of two reasons. The first is that um, you know, surface parking is not a allowed permanent principal use in the RM8 district, which is what that blue area is currently zoned. Now, it wouldn't be the principal use of that site, but um, the fact that it's not allowed in by itself um, traditionally and also that the par property is split zoned um, kind of makes the determination whether it's um, you know an allowed use within that site a little bit murky. Um, I think another important reason is that one small building in that southeast corner of the site that's currently zoned RM8. Um, my understanding is that the, the structure doesn't really have any residential amenities like kitchens or full bathrooms. So, or so, so currently, I mean, that property has been used in that way for I don't know how many years, right? Since 80 whatever. Yeah. Um, it, and so it's non-conforming right. right now. So, so it's going to transfer to a new owner who's going to use the church building, but they're not going to use it as a church. But a church or an office would comply with institutional zoning, right? Correct. So. Why, why, since they're not substantially changing the property, can the non-conforming use not just continue? Why is it necessary? I mean, am I? I understood it because be I thought it was tense. because it's the church that is allowed to operate in a fashion that's not conforming. Conforming because it is a church. Well, so that's one of my. So is it because of the federal exception that allows churches to circumvent zoning? That's probably why the rezoning never happened in the past, is because it wasn't necessary. Um, I will try to clarify, and I think if I understand what you're asking, that, that small existing building on Annandale is zone RM8, and it was used as a, a church function. And that might may or may not be within the RM8 zoning. It's not conforming, but if an office or other kind of smaller retail use Because want, it's not going to be a church that owns and operates correct. the property. Correct, yeah. So let's say an office or a veterinarian or a, day, a spa or a dentist wanted to be located there, they could not do that under the existing zoning. So that would allow for a very limited number of uses from institutional to happen in that small building. Just for that building? Correct. Is it, are we allowed to ask the developer if they plan to keep the trees on Henrietta Street and or the purpose of the small building? 
you can absolutely ask. I mean, I think that would They're here. certainly add to my understanding. So, so, but just to summarize here, this whole exercise is required because the property will not be a church and they might want to do something with that house thing that I'm calling a house thing because the church is using it not as a house, but it looks like a house. Correct. Um, because the, they will be own, the new owners are not going to be a church and they might want to use that small building in a way that would not um, be a house. Correct. Yeah, that's a fair summary. And, and they and want to make sure that that stays parking. Yeah. Right. Which well, but I mean, that's just a non-conforming use. That's what I don't understand. It's just a non They're not changing it. So you can transfer ownership of a property that's a non-conforming use to another owner who uses it in the same way. The developer is dying to get up. I, I know they are, but I, I just, I'm just trying to understand from staff exactly why we have to go through this exercise. If the idea is that this property is just gonna stay like it is and be operated by a new owner, they're not even gonna change the footprint of the main building. They're gonna, it's gonna be a new owner that's not a church. And but for, I think what I hear you saying, Will, is but for the little house that's not a house, um, it wouldn't be necessary. Yeah, that's a fair statement. Um, I don't think staff really got full resolution regarding the non-conforming parking, uh, parking lot issue and the ability of that to serve a future use in the institutional building. We probably would have spent um, more time getting it a, a very final answer on that if not for that small building which needed a conditional zoning anyway. So we recommended the applicant that this conditional so zoning you, So could. you guys were gonna have to figure out whether or not you were gonna allow the non-conforming parking lot to support the use of the existing church for an office use, but you hadn't decided, but they said, whatever, let's do this conditional zoning because we got the little house, not house. Partially. My understanding is that our UDO is very poor. I did watch the PNZ meeting and I couldn't figure out. So I'm just, <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I get it. I just want to ask a quick question. Okay, so by, con by changing it to a conditional zoning, the chances of them being able to sort of uh, make that one whole lot rather than the separate lot which would make it more conducive if, if the redeveloped. developer is going to rent a do up a cost, I mean, for the loans or whatever to do different things to the building. So would that be a reason to make sure you can get it zoned into one lot with a conditional it's zoning? One, it's, one, it's a split zone. It's a split zone. Right. That's what I'm saying. But if you've got a residential split zone with a commercial wow. and you're trying to actually get financing in order to support a project that, that has to have the parking, you're gonna have you're still gonna need that. You're not gonna be able to do it with the residential partial. Yeah, that might be a consideration. Uh, I'd, I'd let the applicant speak to that a little bit more. Okay, um, <laughs> for sure. Okay, thank you. Yep. Do we have Did I answer your question? Yeah, you let us. Yeah, I do feel like really what we're saying. The why is is not clear. No, despite not listening, clear. despite no, talking, I'm and not, personally, I'm not, no, I'm not. I'd rather that. reduce the parking thing. minimum than get rid of a residential zone. But I'm all ears okay, ready to hear. Well, I think let's let them explain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Derek? <laughs> All right, fine. Just, um, <laughs> we had a lot of questions. If you think you can shed any more light on it, please feel free. It's coming. Yeah, it's Hi, my name's Brian Moffitt with Arca Design. Uh, so the UDO actually allows a church to park in any zone. Mm -hmm. So they can park. So it's not a non conforming use. Yeah. It is a conforming use within the UDO for the church to park on that zone. Mm -hmm. oh, but it is not, would be a non-conforming use for an institutional use on that zone. And this is where it gets weird because it's a split zone parcel, right? So it's, it's a single parcel, but it is, um, um, if it was, uh, if, if the existing church building was converted to another, an office use or something like that, then it is unclear uh, in, in the UDO if they would be able to park on that um, RM8 piece of the parcel. So but you didn't get a zoning opinion, you didn't get a determination on that? There, I don't know how we would get a determination Well, you just said that. it's unclear. I mean, so wouldn't you just ask for a zoning interpretation? Um, we did, and this is the, par this is the process that, 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 that led us to here, which was let's just do a CZ on that piece uh, it can only it can only be parking. 
Uh, it can only be parking that co coincides with that existing institutional use. I mean, can we, I, I don't know what happened to Will now, I can't see him anymore, but um, He's hiding. I mean, c could, could we get a, an, a zoning opinion about? Well, it's, it's not just the it's not just the parking. It's the it's the little it's the little house. The mission okay, house. there we go. Because yeah, I mean, I, I was feeling like this seems like kind of a serious exercise to go through just to, to if when staff might have been able to make an interpretation that the parking could still support the structure without a rezoning. Does that answer that question? So so somebody else had a question about what is the plan for the little house. Again, we're we're looking at multiple uses for both for both structures, um, both the well, the existing uh, main church building and that building. But the um, conditions for the CZ uh, limit what the house can be used for, even within institutional structures, which are in the exhibit. What are those limits? To actually? go ahead. <laughs> it's whatever. Yeah. 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 Here we go, residential daycare, office, clinic, financial institution, health and fitness facility, studio, gallery, workshop. And the, the building could be removed and replaced, I assume. I don't, um, since this CZ uh, specifically mentions that existing one story structure, I think that would, well, I, uh, that would, would typically re require would a, a, an amendment to the CZ. Mayor, if I may, I may be able to add some clarity to this. So. It is a split zone parcel, as you mentioned right now, with the primary parcel being already zoned institutional where the church in its previous use sits and that building still sits. The other, what we'll just call the second lot, which is zoned residential currently, including a large parking lot and the small building. In order for that building, that small building to be used as one of these potential uses, it must be rezoned in some way. So it could have been Correct. a straight rezoning. But the straight rezoning would have given much less clarity going forward to what you're seeing now. In other words, because of the CZ element to it, you are able to limit the use of that particular building to these items instead of anything that could have existed within CZ. You also are limiting the parking to stay the same as opposed to being completely redeveloped without any additional input from staff. So a zoning of some type would be required in order to uh, correct what is the split zoning. The CZ adds the limiting factors to both the use of that existing small structure and the parking in its current form without any future zonings to change that. And you feel comfortable that the limitations on this CZ would mean that it's just the use of that structure, they can't replace it, enlarge it, et cetera, and so forth. It, it would be very minimal. A, a, Dates. As Will mentioned, there are certain thresholds that, that trigger additional review, yeah. but, but minimal up a bit of that building, mm -hmm. but essentially the same building that is there now and the same parking that is there now. How, you had a question about trees, but... Go ahead with the trees. Oh, well, it's that and... Okay. I don't see restaurant on here, for example, and I don't see short-term rental on here, for example. So I'm intrigued by the idea that folks would push back that we don't want to change from residential use to commercial use. However, resilient neighborhoods aren't just housing. They include childcare, offices, doctors. <laughs> so I am curious about if we can address the neighbor concerns on are there plans to keep the trees on Henrietta Street and can we get some partnership work done around renewable energy? Um, <clears throat> addressing the trees, I don't think there's any plan to take the, the trees out and, and I wanted to, to follow up on a couple of questions and kind of tie those up. When we run into this, this issue with the non-conforming uses and this kind of split zone piece, and we ask questions of staff, both legal and planning staff, and they come up with a solution, uh, if there's a solution like this that cleans up uh, some uncertainty for them, we're happy to do that, and that's you know how you end up in a situation like this with a very discreet um, parcel here. You know, the project says 3.4 acres, but it's really 0.785 acres that we're really talking about because the front part isn't part of the rezoning request. It's just that. Um, and you will not see many, if any, uh, conditions tighter than the, the conditions here. Uh, the proposal for this project, this parcel, is to do nothing. Um, leave the parking, <laughs> leave the building where it is, and allow these uses that are institutional uses, um, just like the, the front of the parcel. Um, the adaptive re reuse piece, we are seeing more of that. I think those are great questions. Um, uh, I, along with some folks from Beverly Grant and Central United Methodist Church, are in this 
Duke Divinity Program across the state, and we're looking at this exact issue with churches and how they can meet their mission, raise money to do things that they want to do with the church, and use these buildings that are already there and these parking lots that are already there. This is the perfect example. I'm going to take it back when I go back down to Durham uh, as a real-world example of how this works and how it succeeds. Um, then do golf courses. Then do golf <laughs> courses. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of working with uh, staff on doing things like um, addressing uh, neighborhood business concerns and sustainability of those pieces, uh, I know the developer has committed to doing those things. Um, there are questions about um, site plan compliance for the site. Um, the change in use is going to dictate that, and so uh, we expect full uh, code ordinance, level one site plan compliance as we go forward with this. So those concerns will be met across the entirety of the site. Do you want to ask for a condition to keep the trees along Henrietta? I do. <laughs> so would you, some would of these split agreeable? zone parcels that we get, I'm looking at Brad again. I mean, are these, is this because the church can always land somewhere or is this an error and when we rezoned and we broad stroke and miss a parcel line. I mean, well, how do we get to these you places? You want it to run away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this you're is you're doing an excellent job, Mr. Well, Allen. Uh, well, <laughs> our LUPA, which is in the same thing, uh, the Religious Land Institution mm. Use yeah. Protection Act, um, says you can't apply zoning uh, ordinance to churches. Right. And there are a whole bunch of reasons why, uh, but you end up with these pieces and these questions about what's a church use. Uh, parking is a church use, and so that's how you end up with this, and you end up with houses that I don't know why they were turned down. I wasn't here, here. then, but uh, they were turned down and then was used for parking, which is an allowed church use, and so that was a protected use under uh, a federal act. Okay, so it's not really messy zoning. It's a larger picture. Okay, It's a larger picture. Um, building ordinance provisions, those apply, Religious. and those kinds of things, but the actual underlying use, you can't zone a church uh, out of any neighborhood. Like Jesus. <laughs> sorry oh, wow. or a synagogue I'm yes, just going to add that okay thank you thank you are you guys really are you guys oh, torn we have um, some folks signed up to speak on this unless okay. you guys have more I'll, I'll no. say one thing just so and I don't know that there's an answer but um, I hear that we got to like a technical reason of the why and as a split zone, it's just really hard for me to look at half of it without understanding the context of the other half, which is three quarters already parking. Um, so I just, it, it just feels kind of like an incomplete request for me. That, that, I don't know how to say it in, in um, UDO speak, but it just seems like I'm not really understanding why without seeing the big picture of the vision for the site, and I understand that the pretenses in order to invest in this site that, that you want this CZ, but um, uh, I just don't have a lot of clarity on it, which makes me, I don't know, to move something from, I, it, this is my neighborhood, right? So like I know that parcel, I, I know those trees, I've been through that parking lot a bajillion times on my way to Del Vecchio's to get pizza pick up. <laughs> um, there's just like a lot of parking there already. And some of the initial conversation was like, well, to do what we're gonna do on the other parcel, we need to maintain parking. That was the first reason why I heard, but that hasn't come up tonight. So I'm kind well, of just like, what is this I met with here? a developer briefly and asked about, if we had an image up, you would see Merriman Avenue and our bike lanes are nearby. Um, but you wouldn't see any kind of frontage on Merriman, just parking spaces, which for a corridor is never great. Right, so what I had originally said, well, what about this Merriman Avenue frontage? Are you ever going to do anything there? And the answer was the same, like, we need the parking. But in the future, we will not need all of this parking. I hear there's some bike lanes on this road that are going to be flooded with There parking. are not bike lanes on that road. Merriman? No, it stops at Edgewood. Well, we know. I'm saying coming in there. In the future. Yeah. I'm saying in the future. The okay. No, I'm Way just saying that future. I think in the future, this we might ha need less parking. But when I met with them, it sounded like they wanted to do some medical facilities, bring some more small business to the area, and the parking was needed. But my concern wasn't losing that RMA, RMA structure in the back. And my concern was no frontage along Merriman Avenue. But we can't make them do that. And these conditional zoning processes are meant for us to come to agreement. Like, we can't tell them to do something. They have to be willing to do it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. I just am saying I don't have clarity yeah. on their why, which makes me hard to say. Like, 
I think we've gotten really used to seeing full-fledged projects when they're not required as part of the rezoning. We've really gotten used to being like, I see every tree and that should be a, a dogwood. Well, yeah. this one you've got um, certainty on the front piece that you're gonna have level one compliance. And so you're gonna have street trees and parking lot trees and all kinds of other stuff that go with that level one compliance. Um, on the back, you know, kind of the options are right now circling back to something that I thought we'd put to bed, but just to put it out there, if you have this parking lot that's a non-conforming use, but it's already built, uh, how are you gonna stop people from parking in it if that's uh, a facility for their offices? Uh, are we gonna send our planning folks out there to deal with that? No, that's not really a good solution. Um, so I think this really cleans it up from a planning enforcement standpoint. Um, and one thing I wanted to, to bring up uh, to, to Council, Council Monroney, um, we can't commit to a condition to keep those trees along Henrietta. So if we can add that in, um, and while we're adding things in or amending that ordinance, um, I think we need to insert the word uh, for a portion of the property uh, in the title of it. Uh, that might be more clear, even though it's, it refers to that Exhibit A1 and has it. Does that make sense? Uh -oh. Can you say that last can part? You repeat that. You said One yes to the trees, but. Yes to the trees. I uh, just want to make clear in, in the, the proposed ordinance, that draft, um, that it has a, a portion of the property um, in the text of it. Because it, it makes it sound like it's the whole parcel. Correct. Mm -hmm. and, and it probably should have come in as just this 0.785 parcel as the subject property, yeah. but. It's interesting because they kind of forced conditions on the whole parcel, the whole property now. Mm -hmm. and you didn't have to. 101 Charlotte did that too. Um, long ago, we once had an effort to do an urban corridor zoning plan for Merriman Avenue, predates all of us, and it crashed and burned and was very spicy. But one day we might revisit it. Just an aside. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, we do have one person signed up to speak under this item. Folks who sign up to speak, you'll have three minutes to speak. Watch the lights on the lectern. <coughs> ben Mansell. Uh, this doesn't make any sense to me. I, um, I went over to looked at the giant asphalt parking lot by Brookstone and I count 150 parking places plus 15 on Annandale, so 165 parking places. The building is, they say they're not gonna tear the building down, they're just gonna use the existing footprint. But Mayor, I think you were on to the right track because I couldn't understand why you wouldn't want a million dollars of residential lots. Why would you just keep a <coughs> parking lot? And then I realized that if you, this also, this conditional zoning, I just think it's, uh, if you give them that and then they choose to do whatever they want with the institutional zoning of Brookstone, then the parking lot, this extra parking lot will have to always be a parking lot because it'll all be developed, they'll have to have it. But back to the square footage, this, the church is 29,000 square feet. You take 75% of that, get rid of hallways, bathrooms, <coughs> mechanical, you get 21,000 square feet. If everyone drove one car and parked there, 165 people worked there, it's 130 square feet per person. That's without this extra parking lot. So it doesn't make any sense. I think that there is a plan to do something on the lot, and that's why they want this parking in the back. Brookstone did a big destruction to Asheville. 17 properties bought, 20 houses, 24 affordable units lost. The tax base of that, the affordable housing, the fabric of the neighborhood, it's a giant loss. The zoning is absolutely correct here. Institutional on Merriman, residential in the neighborhood. You need to preserve that. It is what it is, it's correctly zoned. Let's not lose all that housing. That It seems lost, but there's, it would come back. You leave this as residential, and any developer who buys this is forced to recognize that this rear lot is residential, they'll develop it. It'll be housing. Thanks. Um, we do not have anyone else signed up to speak under this item. I will close the public hearing. Uh, uh, you, uh, well, okay, we already did the developer talking part. Is that, but do you want to? 
<laughs> um, okay. Um, that was that. So do, do anybody want to make a motion? What do you want to do here? Are you I'll make a motion. motion. Okay. I move to approve the conditional zoning request for the property located at 283 Merriman Avenue from institutional and residential multifamily medium density to institutional and institutional conditional zone and find that the request is reasonable, is in the public interest, is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and meets the development needs of the community in that the request, one, provides infill development in targeted growth areas, two, promotes adaptive reuse as a means of conserving materials, history, and embodied energy in buildings, and three, locates surface parking areas to the rear of buildings in identified innovation districts and along transit supportive corridors. And this is Sandra, I'll second. I have a clar have, clarifying question. Did you need your trees in there? Does yeah, that include our, the condition of the trees? Yeah. You, you have all read okay. my mind. Um, I, I, would, I would suggest, uh, uh, Councilmember Mosley, that the two offered amendments be included, if you're willing, into the motion. Uh, the first one being that the conditional zoning only refers to uh, the what I'm calling the eastern portion of the property that is approximately 0.75 acres, I believe. And then the second, that the condition be included to preserve the trees currently existing on Marietta Street. Yes. I have another clarifying question. Is residential development still allowable in this zone? In, in I saw the current that on the zone list, or the proposed rezone? The proposed rezone, proposed rezone is it allowed? Uh, I, I would defer to Will. What was the question? It's, yeah. it's Henrietta. It's Hen oh, excuse Henrietta. me. Henrietta. Yeah, yeah, residential is uh, one of the enumerated uses uh, in the project conditions. So you could still build housing on this lot the way that we're rezoning it? Suggest. You could build it, okay. you could provide it in that um, building, but you couldn't provided on the surface parking. You, Unless they the came existing back. existing structure. Correct. Unless they came back. Correct. Yes. So right now, someone, since the folks bringing this to us don't own the property yet, someone else could make a proposal on that back personal for more dense housing. Well, they, they could. I think what Will is saying is that you can you can put housing in the existing structures, but you couldn't develop new housing on the site. And what Maggie yeah. is saying is if we voted down some, their project moves forward based on the approval of this body. So perhaps their contract feels apart, falls apart if we deny. And Maggie, to your point, I think that's what you're saying, that someone else might come along and build housing. We don't have a lot of our mate housing zone right, right. now, you're, so they, yes. They so you're making the case for not approving this because it would preserve land for housing yeah missing middle study uh, you know I, um, I you know my biggest concern we don't know what the reuse of the church property is um, and I still have like PTSD from the rezoning of the church on Charlotte Street to be used for a dog therapy which brought hundreds of people out um, and there was an opportunity to weigh in on that decision, we would be releasing our, if I understand this correctly, the way this is working, um, we would be releasing our opportunity to do that. Now, you know, there's a lot of property up and down Merriman Avenue that's institutionally zoned or otherwise zoned for those kinds of uses and we would have no say in it. And so that's already a thing. Um, I'm just putting that out there. Because I want to support the neighborhood that you have the most lived experience in and i'm just wondering if if we vote no it has to wait like what a whole year it has to be yeah well if it comes back as something different i mean that's technically the rule but then we saw somehow we went around that rule or they could just go last for year conditional so, rezoning of the yeah thing. it would have to be a drastically different application i think is the and i think what's different is like earlier you said something of like you know i'm not the owner i'm not going to tell the owner what to do but the, the folks who are seeking this haven't made a choice to purchase this yet. So if someone else could. Yeah, I mean, purposes. I think, I don't know that this is how this contract is, but often you go under contract and during the due diligence period, you, you do this sell. kind of yeah. exercise. And should it not move forward, then you can no. void your contract. I don't know if that's how this is. I have yeah, no idea, but often that's how it's yeah. done. Um, 
I don't know, I'm sensing some hesitancy up here. I'm, sense, I'm not sure how this is gonna land, frankly. I don't um, know. I'm looking at it on the Sometimes GIS when I see this, and it says it's still owned by Brookstone, so. I, yeah, sometimes when I see this uncertainty, I, I think maybe a comeback is warranted instead of a potential no. Um, well, I want to address a couple things. One, uh, the existing structure that is there takes up a portion of that 0.785 acres. So we're really talking about something that's more like a half an acre in terms of the RM8 that's out there. Um, if, it, if it matters on this request, I think that we could um, add in the condition that in addition to parking on the entirety of that, that it could, the entirety of it could be used for residential in addition to uh, those uses that are outlined for that specific building, if that gives you some, some measure of comfort moving forward on this. What would that, uh, so that it would allow RM8 to stay? No, that residential would be an allowed use in addition to parking and those uh, uses that are specific to the existing structure. Oh, well, that's an interesting idea. So that in the future, should these office type residents not stay, it could become housing. And or could not you, could need you, parking. Could you subdivide the property too to, so that that potential is even more possible? Um, I don't know, again, because we're talking about something that is in half, a, half an acre. <laughs> yeah. Well, so to be really clear, Brad, is that standing up? Like, we're saying that, let's find out that this gets developed and it's all dentists or something. And then it's like, <laughs> oh, we don't need all these parking spaces, but thankfully the condition allows residential and then they could build missing middle housing. That would make me much more comfortable if the answer to that is yes, yes. and we could keep, we could allow residential use on the parcel. Or is there a different zoning that we need to be looking at? <laughs> I, I, I think that, that that is viable. Now, what that will do is also alter the condition that currently would preserve, for lack of a better term, all of that parking. So in other words, right now the conditions are set up. I think you're keep, hearing us say yeah. that's fine. So yeah. what we would need to do, Will, <laughs> is essentially remove the preservation of that it would then open up that entire blue area that you saw on that eastern part to those available uses on that previous slide mm -hmm. plus residential. Mm -hmm. In their current parts? I like that. So, what do we okay. Do? Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, that. yeah, just take it off of the structure, make <laughs> yes. it for the entire 7.85. Yeah, can make it all. Yeah. So, There's then do you need to change that motion? <laughs> um, I, I, I think. Um, what, what you would want to do is, with the applicant's agreement, is amend the condition that preserves the parking area within the affected portion of the property uh, to remove the parking preservation requirement and allow all the available uh, mutually agreed upon uses previously uh, listed plus residential. Well, let's well, let's see if the applicant with, accepts it. If they first. accept it, let's just withdraw the motion and do a new Yeah. <laughs> What's happening? Are you writing it down? Attorney. He's attorney. He's the smoke coming <laughs> out of his Yes, ear. I am. This is called practicing the law. This is called practicing the law. <laughs> um, I think if we take uh, the, the condition um, and simply take out. Uh, the, with the exception part. And so the condition would read, um, the use of the portion of the property zone, institutional conditional zone, is limited to surface parking to serve other uses on the property. And the following principal uses which are allowed in the institutional zoning district. And then those lists that are already there. I think that gets us home. Yeah, I would agree. So we can we can Roberts rules this and do an amendment, or we just withdraw the motion and do an I, amendment. I would suggest perhaps we withdraw the motion and if if Councilmember Mosley is willing and and remake it um, for clarity's sake. I need what you wrote down if we need to change <laughs> anything in here. <laughs> Right. Yeah. 
I withdraw that motion. Okay, we got that. Does she need a second? I withdraw the second. <laughs> okay, there you go. Oh, please mention. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to do it. And you just stick right by him. You just don't get Okay, I move to approve the conditional zoning request for that portion of the property on the eastern edge of the property consisting of approximately 740 consisting of approximately 0.5 acres there. Point seven eight five acres located at 283 Merriman Avenue from institutional and residential multifamily medium density to institutional and institutional conditional zone and find that the request is reasonable, is in the public interest, is consistent with the city's comprehensive plan and meets the development needs of the community and that the request one, provides infill development in targeted growth areas two, promotes adaptive reuse as a means of conserving materials, history, and embodied energy in buildings, and three, locates surface parking areas in the rear of buildings in identified innovation districts and along tr transit supportive corridors. And that the project conditions contained in the staff report are amended as follows. Three, the use of the portion of the property zone institutional conditional zoning is limited to surface parking to serve other uses of the property. And the following principal uses which are allowed in the institutional zoning district, residential, daycare, offices, clinics, financial institutions, health and fitness facilities, and studio galleries workshops. Sandra, I'll second. Oh, so just to make this a little bit more complicated, we had the condition to preserve the trees on Henrietta under a, a circumstance where you make a decision to residentially develop that point six seven. What point is seven eight five. I'm sorry, point seven eight five acres, you would need to remove trees to do that so but only under those circumstances yeah and I think that's how that condition should read I would say for so long as the property is not uh, developed as a residential property um, those trees Diesel. along Henrietta shall Can, remain so we're getting close um, no, so uh, uh, council member Mosley this is in addition to what you said okay. without a change and that the additional condition uh, be included to preserve the existing trees on Henrietta unless uh, the property is developed as residential. So moved. No, staff interject for a second, not to throw another <laughs> fall in here, but just want to you know, make clear that um, adding those additional uses to the parking lot area you know, would raise the potential for other uses in a, in a larger capacity than what's currently there or would be allowed under the existing RM8 zoning. So just to kind of make sure that's I don't understand why you say that again. So um, saying that the existing parking lot at the rear can be other uses in addition to residential could add some more intensity of use above and, what, above and beyond what's currently allowed. In it the, means that the parking lot could become a dentist office as well as not housing. just that small building but so the, the entire that's so, okay. so 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 we okay. could have less that. parking space yeah, that's okay. and more space for humans i'm down that works for me that's okay. <laughs> that, right so that would prohibit those other things sure, so make sure unless you can figure it out Will, though, that's helpful that. that is helpful because i think i mean this is a very large piece of asphalt along a major corridor yes. the future of this corridor does not look like this yes. it may not be in this decade but it will be changed in the future, so that's very helpful clarity. Let's do a vote. Well, that was easy. Okay. Second. 
Wait, do we already second? We already second. 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 Oh, okay, we got a motion and a second. We've already had. Um, Is everybody good? All right, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Wow. <laughs> that was eventful. All right. It was unusual, too. But thank you, for everybody, for all of your on the fly help. Uh, that's what you call teamwork. That's right. <laughs> teamwork messy. makes the dream work. Mm -hmm. It was messy. Okay, next we have a public hearing to consider adoption of the South Slope, a South Side Neighborhood Vision Plan, the city's visionary framework to help guide continued long term development of the area. And Sasha Vertinsky is going to talk to us about this. You made it here. <laughs> this one's been a long one. A little head tick there. <laughs> it's been a long one. Thank you, Mayor and members of council. I'm Sasha Vertunsky, and I'm in a former life. I was in planning and urban design. So I'm here with the South Slope, a Southside Neighborhood Vision Plan. And these are a lot of slides, so I'm going to move pretty fast. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so just a few key takeaways. This plan has five main themes and 10 key initiatives. The plan is really striving to build on existing assets, guiding future growth, and connecting and serving the neighborhoods around it. And the vision is here. I'm not going to read that entire thing for you. Um, but really, building on assets is kind of what we're, is the key point here. It's not a big, sexy plan with lots of fancy drawings. We're really trying to make it a sustainable place, a good place for businesses, and, and all other great things. So really quickly, some background. This plan was started before the pandemic. We had numerous meetings. We had a charrette. We also had a pop-up studio on Cox Avenue. We were in a building there for a couple months. We had an advisory committee that gave feedback on drafts um, and helped develop the concepts and the plan. We released it last year and, and collected a lot of comments. And um, additional comment was received later in the year. And I'll, I'll go into that later on near the end of the slideshow. Um, so here's just some pictures from our public input sessions in that pop-up studio. It was, it was a lot of fun doing that. Um, this is the vicinity map that has changed over time after consultation with neighborhoods over the last couple months. Um, basically, this, the boundaries, this is a study area boundary. It is not saying that everything in this boundary is the south slope. Um, this neighborhood, we're trying to make clear that neighborhoods are integral, integral and we're not trying to um, harm any integrity of the neighborhoods. The plan, it seeks to kind of make these neighborhoods more connected to the business district. Um, so here's a little bit of a kind of a closer up look on this. As I said, there's five main themes and I will go through them hopefully quickly. The first one, and then there's 10 key initiatives, we'll come to that. The first one is quality built environment. So we're trying to celebrate the, the great parts that are already there, but at the same time reinforce urban form. Parts of this district um, were subject to urban renewal. And so we have along Ashland and McDowell, we have a very suburban form. And that comes from urban renewal. So instead of um, and a lot of those were single family houses, I think most of us know, many of us know. Um, but so instead, we have a lot of parking lots on Ashland and McDowell with, with buildings. So we're trying to make that a little bit more urban, so it's more walkable, safe, and, and works for everyone. This is a character area map that we developed with, with the neighbors, not neighbors, with, with stakeholders during our charrette process. Um, and really, the red area is kind of mixed use. The, the pale yellows transition areas on the sh what I would call the shoulders of the district. Um, the blue areas are more residential in nature. And then the purple area was an, a neat area identified by um, folks in the South Slope as kind of like the heart of their district, Banks and Buxton. The next theme is unique and inclusive sense of place. You know, this district has been developing fairly quickly um, over the last 10 years, and really we'd like to see this area benefit everyone and not just become one type of district, not just breweries, but also with services that can support residents both in the district and outside, and be a welcoming place to everyone. 
a strong local economy, supporting local businesses, supporting the development of new businesses. Um, the plan mentions a you know, business incubator for BIPOC-owned businesses, um, and, and also creating some physical infrastructure to support those businesses. Housing is also a part of a local economy, and so there are some strategies in here for supporting affordable housing. Multimodal transportation, safe and accessible pedestrian-friendly streets. Um, and there's alleys in this area also that could also be a really great um, livable piece of the area. Strategic infrastructure and natural environment, uh, green infrastructure uh, to mitigate flooding and improve water quality. One thing you may not know about this area is that most of downtown, excuse me, drains through this, this area. So it drains kind of down Cox Avenue and then are in the town, it used to, on the old maps it's called Town Ditch or Nasty Branch and then it feeds into the Southside neighborhood. And Southside neighborhood is also very concerned about flooding. So the more that we can slow down water, capture it, improve the water quality, we also can help our neighbors in, in the south side neighborhood. There are also 10 key initiatives. So these are all built on those five themes. There are more specific ideas. I am not going through all 10 of these, um, but just a few highlights. The plan calls for updating design guidelines and zoning to achieve community goals. And the one th this, is, was an, I, this was one thing we really spent a lot of time talking with the Oakhurst neighborhood and South French Broad neighborhood and East End Valley Street. Um, neighborhoods will be included on the front end of any of these initiatives. So the plan does not call for specific districts. Um, and it has a range of heights being proposed. But again, neighborhoods and property owners in the area have to be at the table at the very beginning of those processes. Um, one thing I will say is that neighbors on both sides of this area are concerned about noise, traffic, parking, and uses. So um, those, some of, we've got a number of tools we can help with that, transition areas, height transitions, landscape buffers, which the CBD doesn't have right now, those kinds of things. Honoring African American history, you know, parts of this district um, really were part of the African American community. This is the picture on the bottom is the Bailey Street School, which was on Ashland Avenue. And it was torn down in the early 50s. And above is Oates Park, which was just outside the boundary of this plan, but it was where the African American baseball team, Asheville had a professional African American team that played there. There's a number of initiatives going on around African American history, but um, it's great to weave it into what's already happening in this area. Developing city-owned property for affordable housing and job creation, you all know about these. This is kind of a model of what 319 Biltmore could look like on the bottom right. And on the upper left, this is outside of our district, but, or outside of the study area, but along South Charlotte Street, we have city-owned land. 319 just turned in their plan, so they will be heading towards you in the next couple of months. Um, Enacting equitable development to benefit the larger community. This is something we talk about a lot in our community and it's kind of, I feel like we're at a time where we need to start figuring out how are we gonna do that. Development happens and we know money is coming into our community. So how can we make it benefit people who are already here? And lastly, making Cox Avenue a green main street, we actually already have funding for the design of this and that project is starting. Um, again, this is part of that, um, we're hoping to treat and slow down stormwater in this area. It also calls for wider sidewalks, a lot more trees. That's probably the one big thing in this area. There's a lack of trees everywhere. There's some, but we really need a lot more trees in this area. So this plan does align with both the downtown master plan and the Living Asheville Comprehensive Plan. Um, the downtown master plan actually called for small area plans to be done after in the following years, and so this is kind of a product of that. The initial round of public comment, we got close to 5,000 comments on the plan from 276 people. Many of those folks lived in or near the study area. Um, and generally, people liked a lot of the strategies in the plan. 
Um, there's a desire for a local grocery store, supporting local businesses, um, and not surprisingly, there are concerns about growth and tourism and the impacts on the surrounding neighborhoods. So our second round of public comment where we really worked with the neighborhoods, um, I probably said some of this already, um, but we worked with the three neighborhoods, South French Broad, East End Valley Street, and Oakhurst in the fall and over the winter. We changed some of the language clarifying um, why the plan boundaries are there and that it's not meant to rebrand anyone's neighborhood. Um, the zoning, zoning district language I've already explained. Um, and we also revised the two maps that I showed you to, to better reflect the neighborhood boundaries. So downtown commission reviewed this last year in June and voted for approval nine to zero and planning and zoning commission also voted then in August to approve the plan. So staff is recommending the adoption of the plan. It'll serve as a guide for future investment policies and engagement with the community. And it doesn't, con oh yeah, I am 10 seconds left. Adoption of the plan does not commit the city to um, carry out any specific projects or regulatory changes, but suggests an overall vision. But it, and it also gives us some backup when we go after funding or looking at projects, capital improvement decisions. So here's a suggested motion for you all. I'd be happy to take any questions or comments on this. I'm just really excited that we're finally at this point. I know you worked really hard on this, and the community did a lot of ongoing input. I remember when we did the pop-up and everything. There's just been a tremendous amount of effort, so I want to say congratulations for getting this far. It's been that much, but um, if there are no questions or anything, I'm happy to make a motion. Uh, we'll, we'll, Go ahead. we'll take public comment. Oh, right. We we have public I actually public. do have a question, yeah. and thank you. I think that well, we came to the right place at the right time, and that's a lot because of your work mm -hmm. and the community that you've worked with. It says on page 23, staff work with these three neighborhoods, South Ridge Broad, Easton Valley Street, and Oakhurst. And yet we heard on Thursday that Southside United was contacted and did have some input, um, but they're not listed. So can we yeah, speak I mean, just I a think minute to we like- We went and met with Southside two weeks ago, I think it yeah, was. We at went their to their association meeting, meeting. At their association meeting and talked to them about the plan, but they weren't engaged in the same way as the other three neighborhoods. The other three, um, and I'm going by the boundaries these neighborhoods have turned into the city. You know, the other their boundaries don't overlap at all. Um, and you know, when we started this plan, um, I know you know this. When we started this plan, they were still kind of forming their organization. Right. So I, I think just think there may be members that are like the, the Southside Community Garden was the picture in there, right? Mm -hmm. so. Are you yeah, worried that if idea. you list them, they they won't? Sorry. There'll be some. Because the, they weren't engaged as fully, it would be. Is that what you're asking that they? Did I just, it doesn't. It's something's not. It wasn't matching. They they weren't included in the engagement, but then there are pictures in the oh, presentation. I see. I well, like, I think the picture's matching. there because there's a night. Some of the ideas we heard from people in there were some folks in Southside who participated in the original engagement. It wasn't as an organization. It was as individuals, and some of the ideas. I remember very clearly were about community gardens. And so that, that picture is more of an example of what the plan Understood. is suggesting. It's not, yeah. Thank you. And the impact of stormwater on the south side was named, so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So what did you say the, um, when you engage south side United, you explained to them that the plan did not overlap with their community yes. group, right, okay? Because I just got a text message from the president of Southside Rising, and she's asking that um, you come back to that group because after you left, I guess within the last 48 hours, some people came to her with some information that's overwhelming her. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So she's asking, I just got the text, and I know we're excited about moving this along, but. But we have been asking about the She said place. that I'm hoping that this evening's South Slope proposal can be tabled. Um, I don't have the time to show up to interject, but I got a message this week about, from some non-residential community members. The information is kind of overwhelming to me. They did say that some of the plan would not affect the residential spaces, but the commercial spaces would be affect, impacted. 
So, Should we go back and look at the map? Yeah. So, um, one thing I did discuss with them. So their boundary that's turned into the city is here at Choctaw Street. Mm -hmm. okay. um, sorry. When I went and talked to them, I discussed with them how East End Valley Street asked us to change, neighborhood geographies change over time, right? And at the same time, people who've been here a long time have a mental idea, like this is what the boundary is. So we have official, quote unquote, city boundaries that people have turned into the city neighborhood services program. But then there's also what the residents think of as their boundaries. So what we heard from East End Valley Street was like, hey, the block is actually a part of East End. Mm -hmm. Like to them, that's always been true. And the people in the block know that and they acknowledge that. And it's in there, I think, I don't think they're done with their plan on the page, but they firmly acknowledge that. So we, we did change this boundary to kind of enlarge and beyond what the official boundary is with East End. And it is well, we're true. talking about the south side. No, I know. I'm, get, I'm getting there. Also, but I'm getting because there. I'm looking at Ashland Avenue, and I know um, Sandra might have a little closer history to I, the original yeah. thoughts I'm, of I'm, what the boundaries are. I'm getting there. Okay. So, so I explained all of this to South Side United when I was there. And I said, you know, part of the reason we called it South Slope, a South Side neighborhood, is because we know that a big portion of this area was considered or is considered by some people to be south side. To call this plan a south side plan would be very confusing to people. And so we didn't want to go down that road because and it is commercial areas only. Now so we are north of Choctaw, which is there, you know, I think we could have whole discussions around the South French Broad and South Side boundary and part of that Lee Walker Heights, you know, I think this map this map and this plan is not trying to forever stamp what neighborhoods are, if that makes sense. I, I think what it's done is the South French Broad area is expanded more. The South side was more, um, it's like it took part of the South side area because- The South French Broad expansion. Yes, yeah, the South French Broad expansion is what, because that's what I was looking at. Um, because where the, um, like Ashland and um, Southside and all that, that was all part of Southside. But I'm looking here and it's become part of the South French Broad. And area. these are the boundaries that, that are- That's what yeah. I was looking for. Was and these are the boundaries that are, they turned in years ago. You know, they, they were more organized at some point and turned those in a while ago. So, so they, the South French Broad was more organized. So they sort of expanded their own boundaries, was that? Yes, it's not, it's not me. But so, I will say, when I met originally years ago with a couple leaders when it was Southside Rising, and I said, you know, because they are planning on doing a plan at some point mm -hmm. in the future, and I said to them, you know, if your boundaries come over part of this area, that's it's completely okay. fine. Yeah. Like, it doesn't stop you. This plan will not stop you from making a plan for areas to me. Like, I, I do think that Southside United, they've got part of McDowell here below Choctaw. I mean, I have no, I personally yeah, think that- Yeah, because see, all the past there was all Southside because basically the six points that sat right in the middle um, corridor, I think what's there in the six, sort of the center area there uh, where Ashland, um, Cox Fife, and all Fife those Fife meet. And, oh, uh-huh. That was, it was six points drive in that was mm -hmm. sort of the center part, mm -hmm. center place for South Side. And that's um, mm -hmm. sort of becomes part of South French Broad and other part is the South Slope. And, and, and Councilmember Smith, I know that you just got a text mm -hmm. and, and essentially the question I guess that maybe we need to figure out is are we talking about geographical boundaries in terms no, of No, I don't think we're talking about geographical policy. boundaries. I think from what I'm interpreting her message to be is um, there are some commercial spaces right on the border that might be impacted by the plan. 
and these commercial owners, the, the owners, the business owners, are a part of Southside United. And they were not represented the day that you came and gave your presentation. Uh -huh. They were unable to weigh in, so their concerns are not yeah. addressed on tonight. I mean, yeah, that's. I I just wonder. This is a vision plan. That's that's about as like far range of a plan that we have. And moving at the speed of trust is pretty powerful, especially when you're thinking about vision. It seems like, you know, this, this has been in the making for quite some time. And, I, you know, I just joined this dais recently. And so I feel a sense of folks being really excited to move forward. And it's not like we have like a bunch of budget ready to go tomorrow. You know, it's like this is really to like crystallize what the community is looking for. So it, it, what are the consequences if we take another couple weeks? Right. Mm, Sasha might quit. Well, <laughs> we definitely don't want that. I don't think she'll quit that goes to the end, but I do want us to keep that in mind. I mean, how long have we been working on this? I mean, it's been a really long time. Really, and it does, I mean, I, I'm not going to argue if you want us to offer two more weeks because of, of this woman's concerns. I'm not going to argue it. But I just want to say that I think often we need to support our staff and get them across the finish line because it's just some of these things go on forever and they're on their plates forever. That's fair. Um, but I don't want to not acknowledge this concern. I'm not sure if it's something that could be handled after a vote. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't want to um, <clears throat> undermine our intention to honor right. the Southside community, right. their history, right. and um, the members who are still stakes of that history. Sure. Um, they are a part of the now and the past. Mm -hmm. So I think if we take a few moments to hear their opinions about where we're going, I think, I think that's the most honorable thing to do. Because in all fairness, we did that for East End True. and yeah, Oakhurst yeah. the last time. So. Then there you have it. I may try to pass the and I, and I will. <laughs> and I okay. sort of understand exactly where this is coming from, because when I first met Sasha probably 10 years ago, she was working on, she was working on this in the <laughs> No, I've not. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was working on the downtown master plan. <laughs> yes, she was. Oh. No, but you, you, she, was, right. she was in the south side. Of, she was in the south side area, and I met her down we there when I first moved back to Asheville. <laughs> And she was, yeah, you were down there. I think it was the Grant, one of those, no, it was probably It was the, probably when you were working on that east of the riverside. Gentrification. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, what it yeah, was. Yeah, and, uh, and basically, and what had happened, there were, say there's been different groups. Uh, this, there's the South Side Advisory Board, when I moved here in 2012, which basically was the actual board, mm -hmm. and I was a member of that. Uh, long for Priscilla, Nias, or whatever. But anyway, mm -hmm. make a long story short, the membership has since changed hands from two other groups since we were actually there. And I think the confusion is coming from, it's just, you know, three different committee groups that have had a hand in different parts and they haven't come in together. So, and, and the lady that she's speaking about, I was that Carson, is that? No, I, and, I, and I, hear your, I hear your explanation, but I really believe that they were developing their own plan while you were at the meat of your right. engagement process. Right. And they just could not do both at the same time. True. So they were kind of like late in the process. Mm -hmm. And I think they did have an understanding at the time, but just like any point of engagement, you go out to your community and you tell them exactly what you heard and they might give you different um, feedback true. on the true impacts or how they interpret it. So it'll be, I mean, I, I know it's been a long time coming, and we've, you know, circled this card a lot of times, but I just have to go back to our intention to honor, you know. Sure, and, and I, I don't really think it's a, out, yeah, and I don't think it's a problem for us to sit down with no, them and explain what's in the yeah. plan, hear what they're planning, and see mm -hmm. if there's any conflicts and or how they, they heard. Can, yeah, when, when you yeah. came the first time, because I agree. I thought that there was a clear understanding. Um, well, number one, they appreciated you coming. And they didn't have any immediate concerns at the time, but once right. they started to speak with other people about what they heard, then stuff started to come up. Right. And she stated that she was overwhelmed. Yeah. So I don't want any person who is a leader 
of an organized part of the community like Southside United to be overwhelmed yeah. with the direction that we're going. Let's just get clear. That's, that's well said. Sasha, you can pass it if you want. <laughs> I'll let you do whatever you're going to do. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Well, if we're going to bring this back in a couple of weeks, do we want to just go ahead and bump it out? Is that what's happening? That's what it sounds yeah. like. Out of respect for the community yeah. leader. Yeah. yeah, I would say so. Okay, Sasha, thank, thank you Sasha. so much. But for, thank you for staying here. All <laughs> we were close. Okay, so we, I think we had... We had two people sign up to speak under that one, but we're not going to do it tonight, so hold that phone on that one. Can I get a motion to continue this? To when is it going? When are we? So April? moved. Second. Wait, do you have vacation plans? Is that, well, really you'd be the yes. one to answer that. Is that <laughs> enough time? <laughs> when spring we'll break, make it happen. Yeah. Well, okay, do you have a second? Second. Same. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right. Great. Okay. Um, okay. Next, we have a resolution to submit to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, a.k.a. HUD, the Home ARP Allocation Plan, and Nikki Reed is going to speak to us about this. Hey, this one's all good. Okay. <laughs> Don't you? Good evening, oh, Council. You? Nikki Reed. I'm the oh, director oh, of the Community yeah. Economic Development Department. I'm here tonight seeking Council's action on submitting the Home ARP Allocation Plan to HUD for approval. So set forth from HUD, um, there's a specific framework for the expenditure of Home ARP funds. Um, the city has now completed all of the necessary HUD requirements with respect to the development of the Home ARP Plan. Uh, that process included stakeholder consultations, a community survey, data collection, analysis, a public comment period, and most recently the public hearing that was held at Council at your last meeting. That plan has remained the same as was presented the night of the public hearing and is now considered final. And so with Council's action tonight, we will submit the plan for HUD approval and keep you updated with next steps. But that is all I have, so thank you. Thank you. So we heard all this, and this is just the formality of voting on it later. Do we do a public hearing? We do. You did. Yeah, we it, did, but we don't a, do it again. Yeah, this is a requirement that the public hearing yeah. be held separate from the vote, so you already conducted that in previous okay. meeting. So we don't, we're, we don't do take it, any right? further comments, so we're ready to rock and roll. Hey, I'll make a motion authorized. Did you want to? No. I'm sorry. Um, motion authorizing the city manager to submit the home ARP allocation plan as an amendment to fiscal year 2021-2022 annual action plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. We did something fast. Um, okay. <laughs> we were all like, yes, quick. <laughs> Uh, new business. We have a resolution adopting the new Municipal Yay. Climate Action Plan for Municipal Sustainability Goals and Initiatives, and Bridget Herring is here to present this. Good evening, members of Council. My name is Bridget Herring. I'm the Sustainability Director, and I'm excited to share the Municipal Climate Action Plan with you this evening. So the key takeaways that I want to leave you with are that the purpose of this project was to update the 2009 Sustainability Management Plan with all the additional resolutions and sustainability goals that Council has adopted since that time. The scope of this plan is focused on municipal operations, where I believe there's still significant opportunity to impact climate adaptation and mitigation. This document establishes a roadmap so we can make continued progress on Council's adopted goals. And what I'm really excited about is that it suggests an implementation sequence so that we can try and make the most out of our limited priorities and has been reviewed and recommended by the Environment and Safety Committee as well as the Sustainability Advisory Committee before that. So again, delving into the purpose, this isn't an exhaustive um, list of the, all the resolutions and policies that Council has adopted since 2009, but it hits the high notes. Um, so all of the policies that you see listed on the timeline are included in the Municipal Climate Action Plan, so including the update to the Carbon Reduction Goal, the Food Policy Action Plan, which was also updated in 2017 as well. It incorporates the Waste Reduction Goal, the 100% Renewable Energy Goal, and all the action items that were included in the Climate Emergency Declaration. 
So this is quite a bit of goals just from 2009, much less the previous goals that were adopted. So this allows us to prioritize and figure out how to drive the most impact and progress on all these goals. So I know this graph is a little fuzzy. So anyone who wants some clarity, it's on page five of the document, I believe, but basically shows you how we got from point A to point B. So we weren't looking at any new policies, so took the input that was received when those policies were adopted, consulted with the Sustainability Advisory Committee and city staff to really figure out what the laundry list of opportunities were. And then the Sustainability Advisory Committee took the time to figure out what was really important and how we should identify what was ultimately recommended to be in this document. And they chose three prioritization factors. One being impact, two being feasibility, and three being opportunities to advance equity. So we took the laundry list that we had, looked at those prioritization factors, and ended up with two or 22 recommended activities that are in the final document. Um, as I mentioned, this got a unanimous recommendation from the Sustainability Advisory Committee for Council to adopt, as well as environment and safety. So as I mentioned, the scope of the plan is municipal operations, and it has 22 activities that are all lumped into three goals. So I know you can read what's on the screen. The way I like to think about it is goal one is the physical things that the city owns, operates, and maintains, and we want those things to be resilient, sustainable, and efficient. When I think about goal two, I think about our decision making, how we use our public resources, so how we're embedding sustainability decisions in budget, in our policies and decision making. And goal three, how do we use the city as an organization, our place in the community, the assets that we have, to help enable our residents and our businesses to lead sustainable and resilient lives. So the final result is 22 recommended activities. Um, they each have a number of descriptors, and the icons on the right kind of show you, um, when you look at the document, the things that are included with each activity. But as I mentioned, it includes an implementation sequence that looks at things that are short-term, <coughs> medium-term, and long-term. And the way that we came up with that sequence um, was looking at overall impact, how long some of the activities would take to implement, the staff that was gonna be really pivotal in implementing those, right, to make sure that we weren't going too hard and too heavy on capital projects at one time or the fire department or whomever to be able to maintain the existing capacity that we have and to leverage current opportunities like the Inflation Reduction Act. What I think is great about this implementation sequence is that it allows us to use the document as a tool. Um, so as new priorities arise, as new opportunities arise, and we want to maybe shift things around, we can look at raising things up and then maybe also pushing things back so that we can maintain that capacity to implement and deliver on um, the activities that are listed in the plan. So again, this is a slide. I'm gonna show you three more slides that have each of the recommended activities in each goal. It's a little overwhelming, it's a lot of text, but we don't have time to dive into each one. Um, but I wanted to make sure that the audience had an opportunity to see the list, and you can again go into the document that's linked in the staff report to get more on which each one is. Just to orient you, items that are listed in bold are existing ongoing activities that we recommend that we continue. And things that have an asterisk are something that is maybe under consideration to be implemented beginning in the next fiscal year. So again, goal one is a lot because it's our physical stuff, right? So <laughs> there's a lot of opportunity in that space. Goal two, a little less items, but again, talking about really those policies and those decision-making levers to make sure that we're embedding this in our everyday work. And goal three, how do we use our place in the community to have an impact um, on our businesses and residents? So that's really a quick snapshot of where we're at. Um, and again, the key takeaways, the purpose was to really update the 2009 plan with all the additional um, policies that council has adopted since that time. We're really focused on municipal operations. I think we have significant impact to um, advance climate adaptation and mit mitigation, especially for how our community experiences that. It establishes a roadmap for continued progress on the council adopted goals. 
suggests an implementation sequence to make the most out of limited resources, and has been reviewed and supported by both the Environment and Safety Committee as well as the Sustainability Advisory Committee. And with that, I'll take any questions. One of the biggest things I've heard from community members that participated in engagement around the Climate Justice Initiative was, you better back this up with a meaningful response. And when I see this, I think how important it is, and I'm really thankful. But I also think about the AIM plan, the Asheville in Motion plan, and the Close the Gap plan that had this really long list of like missing ADA compliance infrastructure and what that means to the most vulnerable people that are impacted by that. So considering those things, it seems like this the only way we get to these goals is partnership as we go. Um, so I was wondering, and maybe this is something that we look forward to with a public safety bond, when we consider the existential threat of climate emergency, I just wish I saw more, we're gonna have to grow the sustainability, not just like manage the department, but like really seriously grow it to meet this in a really meaningful way. And I think just like, I'm not sure what support looks like for that, but I wanna champion you having everything that you need to get these goals done um, with, with some serious funding to back it up. Because when we're thinking about like stormwater issues and crisis management and drinking water and food security, like those are key elements of public safety. And I just, I wanna like just own that we're gonna to have to back this up and it's probably gonna be with bond money, but it definitely better be with partnership. So I'm just gonna be holding this in mind as we have planning decisions moving forward, whether it's meeting our carbon reduction goals, um, securing our water quality. When I see like Philadelphia not being able to drink the water because of spills in the Delaware River, like these are the kinds of crises we're gonna see in our community and I want us to be pre better prepared than we have been in the past. So I guess my question is more like, can we just like get really seriously behind this and amp up and make sure you have the capacity to get the work done? So that it looks like thanks and it looks like a meaningful response to our community. Yeah, and I think that's definitely something we should look at and as is mentioned in the staff report, all of that will come through the budget process. What was really important for me in this first phase was to make sure that we had a lot of buy-in and collaboration from our departments because I'm not a stormwater expert, right? Like we need a good stormwater manager to be able to implement that. Yes. We need to support our fleet manager to, to do good work there and our transit people. And yes. so not only is it this department, but it's every department in the city being resourced and having the knowledge to do that. And I think we need to lift that up in all of the departments within the city to make this plan successful. I, I just want to echo what Bridget just said in terms of you know, sustainability now is a value of an organization. And it's not just housed in one department. It's kind of like equity. It's not housed in just one department. It is all, has to be throughout our organization and, and, and Luckily, we, we have the leadership of a sustainability department, but implementation has to happen across uh, our organization and the community. Thank you. I'll chime in with a thought, um, and this is more just a thought of the stuff that we're doing on council, we're doing in our community takes, takes so long sometimes longer than I want it to. And we don't have a ton of time with a lot of the challenges we're having with climate change. But I have a really unique and intimate vantage point of where we started in 2008 having led that. The fact that this is an organizational value, the team of us that started this in 2008 like could, could barely even dream of that being real. And the fact that now councils before us have set these fantastic policies with real vision over the last couple years and now we have a plan to pull it all together so that we have focused and targeted implementation is just so dang exciting like we're we're off for our next decade of serious climate impact and I can't be more excited to be part of it and we need to beef up all the resources to do it and it's not just one person. If it's one person leading sustainability or one person leading equity, we're going to fail. It's it's institutional, it's cultural, and I'm just uh, couldn't be prouder. So thankful that you're leading us through that. I think you're doing, you're one of the best I've seen in our country for sure. I'm just really excited. I can't wait to, to vote for this. Speaking of which. Should I make a motion <laughs> to adopt? Yeah. Should I make a motion yes, to please. adopt this? Do I have to say something fancier than that? There, there might be a, a suggestion. 
Can we remember that <laughs> big? Um, it's on the document. I make a motion to adopt the Municipal Climate Action Plan for Municipal Sustainability Goals and Initiatives. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second before we vote. We have one person signed up to speak under this item, and that is Gerald Meyer. Uh, did you second? Kim. 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 Hello, I'm, I'm Gerald Meyer. I'm a resident of the south side of the city and a retired uh, community development and economic development practitioner. Um, I come before you because I represent a group of the Asheville Buncombe County Critical Services Microgrid Group, which is a volunteer activity. Um, I really believe, as you've already said, that this is a great municipal action plan uh, for addressing the climate. But I think there are a few things you might want to consider in implementation and maybe even amend the plan to mention them. Uh, let me give examples. In uh, goal one, the activities, particularly around energy, um, have lots of emphasis that would be helped by what's called a microgrid. And a microgrid, in a very simple sense, is production of electricity or production of power, the storage of power, batteries, and controls to control what's going on in the buildings that the power is being provided to, and to be able to isolate it when there's power failure, resiliency problem. As we know, the grid's gone down due to storms, vandalism, other reasons. So um, they're almost all of the uh, 13 activities under goal one could be related to this in some way, but let me highlight a couple. Renewable energy installation and on-site solar alternatives. Microgrids are particularly designed and helpful to offset peak demands and provide enough power to create green hydrogen or a locally and economically provided alternative clean energy source for the city. Equity and sustainability. You, if you do microgrids in the right way, you can provide alternate power when there is the interruptions I mentioned. And it also can be used to support EV charging stations for vehicles, whether they be the fleet of the city, which is mentioned in one of the goals, or they be residence uh, vehicles. You do have climate justice and equity and resilience in the plan, which is very excellent. And this can be a properly implemented microgrids can be a climate justice initiative too, and be help neighborhoods. Let me give you an example of a neighborhood that I know a little bit. I won't claim to represent a neighborhood, but I at least would say that you ought to look at the Linwood Crump Recreation Center in Shiloh as an example. I know it already has 47 kilowatt power solar panels on it, and they're net metered with Duke Energy. That's an appropriate deal at the moment, but if you... Thank you. Is that the time limit? Yes, oh. that is. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> if you have your comments written, you can submit them, but if they're, it's, if they're just your notes, don't feel pressure, but we would love to read them if you wanted to share They're otherwise. kind of a combination of notes, let's say. Okay. Fair. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks for your work with the microgrid group. I, I participate in a couple of those meetings. I know you meet weekly. You've been doing really technical volunteer work, and I think there's a lot of potential for where we're going the next decade with this work, with that type of thinking. Thank, Thank you. you, Councilwoman. I think there are people in that group that would be very willing to work with the city to help implement some of these things and give advice on a free basis. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we did have one other person signed up to speak, Tim Sadler. Hello again. Mayor and City Council. I um, want to congratulate Maggie on your winning. Um, I actually, the first public meeting that I ever attended for Asheville was the sustainability meeting, and, and Maggie was always just awesome. So. Um, glad to see you up here. Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of kind of outside of the box things that are going on. You know, solar panels and wind, you know, while it might have seemed like the best thing 
15 years ago, if we really look at how we're getting our solar panels, where they're coming from, the minerals, and the process of you know, having to deal with them, and over time, it's not necessarily renewable. So I am so pleased to uh, mention PXVNEO in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Um, it's a waste to energy plant. It's the first in America, and the municipality actually owns it. Um, it's the first North American hydrothermal carbonization facility. So I have contacts there. Um, and that's actually where I'm from, uh, that area, the same county. So I'm familiar with this project. And, you know, I also wanted to mention maybe, um, you know, this might not be right for our community, but if anyone's familiar with Oak Ridge in Tennessee, they have a, a thorium a nuclear plant, which is almost no waste or, you know, it's, it's something that they're developing better nuclear, you know, strategies. And, you know, they have that one plant in, in Oak Ridge, which is not too far. So, um, yeah, I just really um, am thrilled, you know, with the leadership uh, on this topic. And um, if anyone would like more information about PV, I'm sorry, PXV, NEO, um, you guys know where to find me. Yes, send it along. Cheers. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion and a second. We have concluded the public comment on this item. All right, unless there are any other comments, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. All right, last but not least, um, we are going to hear an ordinance adopting the fiscal year 2024 fees and charges manual. Um, and this is part of our budgeting process where we always look at the fees and charges portion of our budget at this stage so that staff can build it into what will ultimately be a final budget that we vote on. And also so that we can communicate to our customers and in advance. And we can of, communicate to customers <laughs> of anything. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you, Mayor and Council. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, bookend your work today. Uh, so I'm going to try to move through this quickly, but please stop me with any questions. Uh, we'll kind of start with a broad overview. We'll go over the three, I would say, most significant uh, fees that most of the folks in our community uh, pay, and then a few others where we have changes. So overall, uh, you know, as the mayor said, we staff reviews fees and charges as part of the budget process every year. We bring forward recommendations early in the process for the reasons mentioned. Uh, those do represent a relatively small portion of the general fund revenues, but are really significant for our enterprise funds, uh, including water and stormwater, where we have recommended increases uh, this evening. Um, again, we are recommending increases there, as well as for solid waste. Those impact most of the households uh, in Asheville, and we are not recommending any changes for transit parking or special event fees at this time. So why do we charge for service? Uh, one reason is that customer versus community benefit. When there's kind of a specific individual benefit, we usually will uh, charge folks, whereas a, a broader community benefit, we, we may not. We also sometimes that allows us to ensure access through charging. Um, and then we also have statutory requirements like with our development services where we uh, charge a fee related to providing those services required by the state. Uh, when we're looking at how much to set the fees at, it is uh, cost of service is a key component. Of course, we want to make sure that we're recouping uh, the cost or some portion of the cost in, in most instances. Who benefits? Again, that gets back to that customer versus community benefit. Uh, and then we do have some fee studies that we've undertaken over the last several years, including for development fees and uh, parks and recreation fees. So again, uh, in the general fund, the uh, portion that we're talking about from the revenue side, and this is our, our current year general fund budget, makes up about 12% of uh, the overall budget on the revenue side, whereas on the enterprise funds, and this is all of our enterprise funds together, it's about 73%. So again, a significant portion of the funding uh, on the enterprise side. 
So looking at those three that do impact uh, most households in the community, this is kind of the, the overall, and this is really what we look at. We wanna try to minimize this while making sure that we're investing in these services uh, to, to continue to provide and, and expand where we can. Um, you can see that overall increase for those three, for an average household or a typical household, I guess I should say, is around $10.89 a, or for the bi-monthly bill and with an annual increase of just over $65. So moving into water, um, at a high level, uh, water's budget, interestingly, is kind of split evenly in thirds between capital and debt, personnel and operating costs. Water is our largest enterprise fund in the city. And we wanted to provide a little bit of information about uh, the users and the customer classes. Um, you can see that our single family residential customer class, <clears throat> excuse me, is both the majority of the number of accounts in the, uh, that the water fund has and also make up a significant portion of the water consumption as well. Uh, we did provide some information at the council briefing, excuse me, last uh, week. I um, wanted to mention a little bit of that. We reviewed the rate structures for 12 other systems in uh, mostly in North Carolina, but South Carolina as well. Just a few things, a few takeaways there. Uh, most places uh, that we looked at the, of those 12 do have tiered residential consumption rates. So essentially, as you consume more water, uh, that water gets more expensive. Uh, different rates for non-residential users, again, commercial, industrial users having different rates from, from residential. And then, and I think this is an important note, uh, most places also have different rates for customers that are outside of a geographical limit. So for example, uh, much like you know, the city of Asheville provides service out, water service outside of the city limits, many other municipalities and, and counties do the same. Uh, and they charge folks outside of that geographical boundary, that political boundary, a higher fee than they do inside. We are prevented from doing that by uh, the Sullivan Acts. And uh, lastly, uh, our, our customer costs are pretty competitive and affordable compared to systems that are similar to ours. So what we're recommending with water fee changes is an increase in the base, base fees charged to customers, and those vary according to meter size. We are also uh, looking at an increase in consumption fees, the volumetric fees that are charged to customers, and again, that's based on the volume of water used. And then we have a, an increase in our hydrant meter rentals, and that's really related to uh, development uses. One note to make, uh, we do have a cost of service study underway with our um, Raptalis, the folks that help us with our water rate model. And that's gonna assess the rate structure and um, any recommended changes to that structure will be considered in the next budget process of so the FY25 process. Did wanna mention, uh, we did see rates go down when we lost the ability to charge that capital fee <clears throat> in FY20, and we're still trying to recover from that. That um, did impact our, our capital funding for water, so uh, we are trying to, again, slowly kind of build that back up, as you can see. Um, so what we're looking to do uh, with the additional funding that this will provide is add some additional maintenance, staffing at water treatment plants, uh, staffing for both communications and customer engagement, uh, some additional support on the billing side as we transition through the advanced metering uh, project, and then again to continue to recover that $7.5 million in lost revenue uh, from that capital fee that we're not able to charge, and we're trying to do that through adjustments on both the base fee and the volumetric rates. Any questions on water before I move on? Oh yeah, I got some questions. So at our um, finance committee meeting, I had the same questions I did the year before, and I know we have a study coming up and looking at rates. Number one, do we have an update on when we might look at monthly billing? I think the uh, meter project is essential to shifting to that, and that project's underway. I don't know what the timeline is, I think. Just because I'm wondering like, if folks are like, oh my gosh, just is it even possible like we'll get an answer in August and we could like revisit this in September? About you, this is solely on the issue of moving a month water rates. billing. Right. I'm gonna let David Milton. We don't have to wait a whole year to do that. 
Good evening, David Melton, Director of Water Resources. The, the plan is to move to monthly billing, but we have to have all the meters installed to do that. So we're looking at about a two and a half, three year time period okay. before we get there. Okay. But we could move to monthly billing even without that change so long as we got an agreement with MSD because we do their billing as well. I mean, I don't think we have to have a different metering system to do monthly billing. We actually do. We don't have oh, because staff. Mm -hmm. yeah. You mean because capacity. you need to get need the to... reading on the, on the meters. Mm -hmm. right. But the staff literally drive down the street and it picks up the meter reading. Well, and part of the reason for the metering project is we have failing transmitters on the present meters. So we've got a big mix right now of right by and the old fashioned flipping the lid, looking in there and getting a reading. So which takes a lot, the manual takes a lot more time. Well, and so I mean, if we really wanted to move ahead with that, I think we'd want to ask what it would take to make the transition before. Because I know a lot of folks are like contacting, I'm sure a lot of us saying like, hey, my water bill is all of a sudden really high because there was a mistake. I know there've been a few emails about this. And so question number one is, when can we move to monthly? Because um, it would catch mistakes early, but it would also be in line yeah. with other utility billing. Yeah. And then another idea that came up is why not raise the base rate more because we might have some folks who like, let's say they don't live in Asheville full time and so they don't have that CCF usage. So that means the full time residents of Asheville with the bulk discount for commercial that we have is steeper than the other um, peer cities. Um, are bearing the burden for the most infrastructure. Now I will say, then Thursday happened and you brought us this water system rate structure with other cities that was really helpful and it's not in these slides. So for folks who wanna see them, it was part of our um, agenda briefing on Thursday. But what it showed me is that our jump in non-residential commercial leaps at tier one from 404 to 251 and there's no other of the peer cities that jump that low. So it's like my concerns about the um, deep discounts for bulk commercial is like, gosh, it's worse than any other peer city. And I don't know if we have to wait to do something about that. So the best thing I could come up with after the bazillion phone calls and conversations between Thursday and today is this. I know we want to give people a heads up. Can we bring this back at our next meeting and just look at a higher base rate and or just keep the residential at 477 while we wait for the study and bump up the non-residential commercial from 404 to 441 as suggested and then change the um, second tier to be match the next lowest which is high point at three dollars keeping in mind hendersonville is 428 that's our next door neighbors charging way more. Kim, I lost you on the last. Yeah. Just on that I just, last one. I, think, I got you on the other. But the, I think everything my, but main, the my main ask is can we yeah. just take two weeks to look at this? Because it seems like we're putting the burden of our infrastructure needs, yeah. which we need to address, on the full time residents the most. So, so I, I, I will wait. echo the general sentiment that the rate comparison made it very clear that. So, a lot of these cities have like Charlotte and other places, they have a tiered system. So if you are a low residential user, your first however many gallons you pay, I'm making this up, $1.50. And then as you become an increased water user, your next 150 whatever gallons is two fifty dollars a gallon. So, so it incentivizes you to, and also makes it more affordable for families who aren't using the more a lot use, of water. So the, the less bigger you use, your rate. The, the lower rate you experience. Mm -hmm. Actually, we're not doing that. We have this one size fits all residential rate right now. This is on the usage side. Mm -hmm. What the chart didn't show us was the full, the full water rate that customers actually pay because it didn't include the base rate. It didn't include all the things that you would get in your water bill for comparable cities. So sure. we are a little bit blind in terms of an apples to apples totally. comparison. Mm -hmm. um, but what we did see was based on the usage in it, there's, it seemed pretty out of whack. So one, one concern I have is how do we tweak this so that we create greater um, affordability for residential users and not uh, put off kilter the water budget? Because I mean, we have, we have a lot of capital and projects we're doing in the water budget, but it's very clear that we need to make a transition 
to relieving the, the fees charged to residential customers. And that's gonna mean, ex base rate is one way to address it, but, but, ex but increasing those rates for our industrial commercial users and looking at our multifamily housing units, which are getting a deep discount, even though there are people using the shower just like people who live in a house are using a shower. Whatever. Unless you're only in the house six months of the year and then you're getting a deal because everyone else who lives here full time is picking up the tab from the infrastructure. Yeah, and another usage. thing came up, which I thought was interesting, I'd hope this person would be here today, is um, it was brought to me, we've created sort of like a, a moral uh, pothole where the, the discount is so steep that you're actually incentivized if you get close enough to just run the water. And then if you do that, you're saying, well, just go ahead and turn on the faucet and it's, it's worth it because I'm gonna pay less at the end of the day. And I wonder, is that where our leaks are coming from? I hope not, because that would mean that we're, we set up our community to fail each other. And if I, we're that close to it, just give me two more weeks and I think we could get closer to like understanding the whole picture. I don't, I don't follow that last part exactly. I would, what I would flip that on its head, there's no incentive to conserve at all. Yeah, absolutely not. Yeah, I mean, there's not, it's the same rate regardless. So, uh, you know, I wonder um, if, there, if, if there is a way to pull out the water piece from the, what the presentation you're giving us today and the fees and rates we're being asked to vote on today. And to take a deeper look at that and bring it back to us in a couple of weeks. The, the only thing that we would request though, in terms of our ability, the staff time that it's gonna take for us to do this when we are almost duplicating the work that the consultants are trying to do for us. And we, we wanna do this, be very intentional. We wanna have lots of data. We, we're talking about running some additional modeling so we can get to the yeah. answers that you all well, want, but we just don't wanna. Uh, yeah, sorry. and I, I, I get that. I mean, I, they're not gonna look at other uh, jurisdictions and do a rate comparison. They're gonna do a rate analysis within our own That's system correct. and look at our capital needs and, and things like that. And, mm -hmm. So, so one, um, one way to, to do this for now might be that we hold the residential rate, yep. don't increase it, only increase the other categories mm -hmm. yep. to make up the differential. That and that special. might mean a more aggressive <laughs> increase than what you're presenting to us tonight to get to those numbers that you need. Um, that's what you were saying, right, Kim? Yeah, yeah exactly that's what right. I thought. Yeah. I'll say well, we no, she was also freeze, talking no, about, you're, you're you were also talking basis. about increasing the base Jeez. rate, and that I'm was saying, another suggestion. Yeah, I'm saying don't do that part, yeah, just right. do the freeze the residential and increase the other categories. It has that's suggested as we get closer to the study that we should include a look at the base rate because then it captures more of the revenue from people yeah. who are benefiting from And that from might not take more water. time because right. that might be. I'm so But for right that. now, we now, could make a budget amendment in two or three months or whenever we get the study that's always sure, potentially coming. Could, but right now, we freeze the residential, is my so, suggestion. So you're, you're um, probably going to frown because the bulk of our customers are residential, but only half of our usage is residential, if I remember from the presentation. So we would there. be yep. capturing, yeah. Yep. Um, the, the half of the usage half. with a rate increase. So I'll, I'll jump in quickly and, <laughs> yeah, sit, and say that, that um, get out your I think <laughs> I, I would suggest that we, if you all are not comfortable with where we're at on the overall uh, water system, water fee changes, that you give us an opportunity to look at them holistically and not approve some of them because it is kind of all connected. Yeah, and I think we're, we're not, we're, what I'm suggesting is we don't vote at all on water rates. Tonight. We're just Tonight. giving you Correct. some direction for how to bring it back to us in and a that, couple weeks. And that, without being 100% prescriptive about zero growth here, X growth there, we want to say lean away from increase on residential as far as you can. I'm leaning towards to freezing the on residential. I'm, free. I'm, in I'm feeling freezing. pretty good about freezing. Okay, the about but, what? But I don't, I, I don't know <laughs> what that will mean in terms of making up the balance of the yeah. need yeah, that's on, what I'm saying. on the multifamily commercial manufacturing irrigation wholesale. So. I mean, you'll, you'll, Could we get that in budget work session 15? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, really, how quickly could we get it? I don't mean to joke. I mean, I think we may be challenged to get that prepared for uh, okay. the, the <laughs> April 11th work session, honestly. Okay. Um, and we want to really give you I know. good information. Well, and 37% of our customers are residential. It's a bigger, it's a big it's change. Not, it's 37 and a half. 
way more than 30. Oh, I didn't do multifamily. I didn't do multifamily. I consider that more commercial. But. Well, no, I'm, single family residential is 53,000 yeah. accounts. That is yeah. the most, most of our. Oh, I was looking at that. But the usage water, is, yeah. is, ha is about half mm -hmm. if, because they pull multifamily out. Yeah. But when you see the rate for multifamily yield, yeah. it's, yeah, it's, like it's way lower than. Um, what do you mean? Well, a lot of those multifamily multi See how their... multifamily. Yeah. So if you live in an apartment building, the per gallon rate is much less than if you are yeah. being billed at a home. Mm -hmm. This was in our documentary. Yeah, our, look at that. A lot of those multifamily are being billing <laughs> their <laughs> residents, right? Yeah. Right. They might include it in the rent. Yeah. Like and, right. and then they have and, different and infrastructure, maintenance, like et cetera. Yeah. 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 You know what, though? To, to really do this right for multifamily, you would want to get more nuanced. And, You'd have and, to. And there, but there are restrictions because you can't do a differential rate across the same class of customers. So I, I, and I don't know if um, you could figure out like this is affordable housing That's or a thing. tax credit I mean, housing. Right and so it could have a different rate than yeah. a market rate multifamily. Yeah. You know, anyway, we're getting a little into getting, the weeds, but you, I think you get the gist of the, the concern. No, I do. I, I, I get the gist and understand, but the study that's underway now is looking at that and there's several different scenarios and we know that our commercial and industrial customers are getting a great deal right now that that's got to come up um i just don't know that we would have time to really do a good job at it even before july and, and like the, oh, wow. the city manager said we're almost duplicating some things that are going on with our consultant now and we expect them so the type of thing, what I'm actually hearing is like, we're all actually on the same page. We're starting to see this potential for shifts. Sure. Y'all have already been seeing it too in your scoping. Someone's kind of crunching those numbers now and they'll give us an assessment in August? Late summer, early fall. So is, this right. is me like doing really out of the box thinking. Is there any way we can like uh, just not do anything with not water do rates anything with water and say we will do we yes. will visit water rates yeah. in September. That's an alternative that's as well. Yeah. That's yeah. an alter. Yeah. My only what? concern was if you really need to grow the revenue because we have yeah. capital yeah. and you you. I'm saying yeah. I challenge you all to figure out a way to do that not on the backs of increases to residential customers yeah. for this right. cycle. If you that. want to have something in place by July one, if it's impossible and you have to wait for the study, then I would prefer not to do anything until we get. And then we look at like a January one start date, which something that I mean, we're also about to hear from the 90 day study from this big water interruption we had that probably has some dollar figures with it that I don't know to me if if we revisited and had like a water rate conversation in the fall and financially the utility could feel confident in a potential rate change happening six months later, January one instead of July one. That would be an interesting thing to brainstorm about. So we we can come back with a <laughs> recommendation yeah. as to a possible path forward. We hear you all clearly. Uh, we understand that um, you want us to figure out a way to minimize the impact as much as possible on residential ratepayers. Most of us all are. Mm -hmm. So yes, we will we will come back with the with the recommendation. And. Um, you know, I know that it's work, but the and the chart that we got in finance was helpful in the sense that it showed us what the user, the the rates were for usage, but it did not provide the flat fees that are included in billing. It didn't give us a you know cross section of well maybe the flat fee in Charlotte is three times as high as right. the one it is in Asheville, and they actually have the same size water bill. I, you know, it didn't give us that kind of information. So that. Eventually, I want to see the whole picture and and some, um, you know, really drilling down on the different options for dealing with multifamily housing and some of these because, you know, you were saying in some cities it's lumped into this category and some cities it's lumped and it makes a big difference. And commercial tiers also, you know, we, we there's more tiers possible for, there's a lot of different ways. Sorry, that's just a micro thought. Anyway, where so that's where we any more discussion on water before we keep going with this? What are we doing? Uh, well, we got to finish. <laughs> Taylor's got, <laughs> Taylor's got more fees to talk about. I just want to make sure there's no other water 
questions. Right. But we're, and, and we're, because I think he asked, Mayor, what are we doing? We're coming back to you all with the, with the path forward uh, at the next council meeting, or agenda briefing, or what, whenever the next meeting. Council, is there a consensus around um, doing that kind of broader examination uh, with these water rates yes. and not just moving yes. lockstep with the recommendation yes. that's being presented? I'm, I'm on board with that. I just that. want to make sure. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I, I do want to make a quick note that likely that would mean jeopardizing some of the plan service enhancements in addition to some of the things we talked about in the budget work session and, including and, and again employee. that's why i'm saying if you if there is no way if you can't if you don't want to just freeze water rates until the study is done and you know that you need to grow revenue i what I, my personal position would be is show us how you could do that not affecting residential rates okay Got it. that's that's where i'm or and be, until we get or the study we look done. at an incremental stair step delay. Yeah, I'm looking at phasing. But I mean, the phasing to be like, we're going to start here and then we're going to get the study. So we're not just doing triple the amount of work and duplicated work. But like you said, the January one. Yeah. So staff will look at the feasibility and the impacts of. All the yeah, numbers you all, of this. You all look stressed, right? like something really bad is going to fall out. The say, externalities are, are vast, perhaps. I don't we'll be gonna, happy to bring you additional information. In world, <laughs> if it's not the hardest thing in the world, it has been brought to my attention by um, neighbors. This is why community engagement is so important. I've just like was having these phone conversations on the way to the bus stop. Um, include Boone. Boone has tourism. Boone has a differential rate. Like. Maybe put that alongside here if it's not the biggest deal. If it is, whatever. There's other higher priorities. But this this rate structure was really helpful, so thank you. And also, I mean, I'm I, sorry. I think what I hear you saying is there's not time to go do this big study and look at all these different municipalities. And this study that's underway is not going to do that. That's so, true. so I don't know when and where we consider these other, um, unless it's just updating this table and adding Boone to it, which. You know, and then yes. adding the other fees to it so we really have more of an apples to apples way to compare these rates, which I think would be very helpful. And par part of the reason that those weren't included is because there is a really wide array of yeah. structures. And so, for example, most of those places, as I mentioned, that in the 12, sorry, that we did peer benchmark, again, most of them do have differential rates for people outside of their city or county or where have you. Sure, they have, that, services, they have that going on too. Which, yeah. which, which makes we can't. A, a significant difference. Yeah. Um, but we can include all of that information for you all if that would be helpful. Yeah, and what Excellent. we really tried to do was to understand what are our condition, our unique cir circumstances. For example, Boone has whole house Airbnb. We don't, I mean, so it's hard for us to you know, apples to apples. And I think they probably have a much smaller system than and, we do. As and well. a much smaller system. So I, I, I think that um, we will come back, provide you all with some additional information. And again, I think we hear what the goal is. Yeah. And that's to lessen the impact on Residence. our residential customers. So we, we get it. And I do we'll want to share that, yeah, and multifamily in there too. I, it's not as simple as just single family. Residential. All residential. Thank you. Thank you, Sorry. <laughs> All good. It's okay. Yeah. All right. Moving on to stormwater. <clears throat> I think probably most of you all have seen this before, so I'll move quickly. But really, our main uh, challenge with our stormwater system is deferred maintenance, and what that creates are you know our folks uh, and spending time and resources being reactive to address those emergency repairs that are needed, limiting our capacity to do you know, the projects that we've identified and strategically invest in the system, which overall makes for a system that is not in the desi our desired state, which again, kind of leads back to that deferred maintenance. So that's really the, the trap, if you will, that we're trying to get out of with stormwater. We, we also have a consultant review that is underway with our stormwater system. They've already provided a, some information for us on the both capital and operating resources that they think we need to help maintain our system. That's uh, part of what uh, part of the, that work is incorporated into this recommendation. Um, they are also looking at the, the fees and fee structure and doing a comparison again, similar to what we were just discussing with water. We expect that to be completed uh, later this summer. 
So what we're recommending is a 15% increase uh, in those fees. Again, these are the, the tiers, stormwater tiers. Most folks fall into that 2,001 square feet to 4,000 square feet. Uh, that's where the bulk of our residential uh, folks are. Um, some service enhancements we are hoping to fund with those additional fees include a maintenance crew uh, to, to do re that repair work, some additional staff to enhance inspections uh, for constructed stormwater devices, so that's like new construction, private property, commercial property. Uh, system mapping, this is a really, really big point for us is making sure we understand the state of our system uh, so that we can, again, make those strategic investments. And then some uh, vehicle and equipment purchases uh, for stormwater. Any questions on that piece? Go to next. All right, moving on to sanitation. <clears throat> Uh, similar, you know, we have uh, some need for additional positions just to keep up with an increasing number of collection points as, as we add those as people move into the city. Uh, continued cost increases to dispose of our uh, waste, whether that's recycling through the contract or landfill tipping fees. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then we are also looking to review operations, financing, and ordinances to really address some of the challenges and help us improve our service delivery. So uh, just again, a little bit of history prior to the current fiscal year, the last fee increase was approved for sanitation was in FY17, which was a, a while ago. The current, uh, current year increase was $2 per month. We're recommending $1 per month for next year. And uh, we would look to use that to fund the solid waste master plan, um, as well as some additional staffing, staffing to support those um, added collection points. Any questions? All right, so quickly, some other changes. We did want to note uh, some of the parks and recreation fees. We have a moderate increase to the fees at Riverside Cemetery that helps support the maintenance of that facility. We actually have some reductions in usage fees for uh, recreational athletic facilities, multipurpose fields. <clears throat> reductions to fees for weight rooms um, and a increase to the swimming pool fee again to help support maintenance and operations of that, those facilities, I should say. <clears throat> Specifically for after school and summer programming, there is an increase to the fun day out inclement weather programming from five to ten dollars a day, but did want to make a note that that's not paid for um, youth and teens that are enrolled in after school programs. They have access to that already. We're adding a new fee that provides some flexibility for those programs to use them single day instead of at the weekly rate, which we also hope will generate some additional capacity in those programs. Um, and then, again, just an, a note on um, that we do pr offer installment payment plans to mitigate the impact um, of accessing those programming opportunities. Um, some other uh, changes that are recommended, uh, the changing the way essentially that tournament fees are charged for a specific tournament at Aston Park, providing some flexibility for the Nature Center really to help them with uh, development of new programming through the year, and then some stormwater development fees just based on the cost to deliver that, those services. So wrapping up, again, we look at these every year and bring forward recommendations. They're a small but not insignificant portion of the general fund, a very significant portion for our enterprise funds, uh, we've recommended increases to water, stormwater, and solid waste, and we are not recommending any changes for transit, parking, or special events. So if there are not any questions, it sounds like we are holding on the water fees, but... You seem kind of reluctant to digest that. <laughs> it's a lot more work, it sounds like. <laughs> No, nope, no questions. Well, no questions. this does um, bring up one of our ever-evolving issues, which is the agenda work session. And um, there were uh, only three of us there, <laughs> the last one when we covered this. So we got to figure out a solution to the, the work session so that everyone can attend and we can kind of give staff a little bit of a preview of concerns around things like this um, so that we're not, you know, we're doing it in rehearsal rather than <laughs> prime time here. That was rhetorical. We'll figure it out, but we got to figure that out. No, that's a good point because we have been very 
lengthy and everything this evening. And um, and that's and I wasn't able to because this that. is like a work session mm -hmm. slash right. <laughs> council meeting. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we, I don't know if we know, I know, I have another city meeting at the same time. Like, it's a little bizarre, but um, not, we can talk about that later. She, uh, These twice, are great. Twice a month, or once a once month. month. Once one a of, month I have to that you have an overlapping. One of them. Yeah. Anyways, this looks great. I have no questions. Um, okay, so. Are we going to make a motion? Well, hold on. I, so we're, so this is one of these ones where we take public comment, but first we need a motion. So whoever makes the motion, be mindful about the water part. So I would make a motion to adopt the recommended fee changes, but for the water utility fees. fees. Yeah. Somebody second Second. That? Okay, any other questions or comments before we take a public comment on this item? Okay, um, again, folks who signed up to speak, you'll have three minutes to speak. Watch the lights on the lectern, um, and red means Stop. Nina Tovish. Thank you. Okay. And next is uh, Katie Hudson. I'm going to make this as quick as possible. Hello. Good evening. Thanks for hearing me. Why aren't we charging higher rates to businesses that consume more water? That was addressed already. Incentivize conservation to prepare for failure if we prioritize using less water at every level of consumer, then we will be able to withstand a shortage or outage better in the future because our equipment will be able to withstand it better. Also, if we prioritize delivering water to more people rather than one central location, uh, our infrastructure will be able to withstand climate change better because it's the smaller pipes that break faster and you have to scale. Okay, let's skip that. Uh, in attachment B, table A, Asheville is the only one charging more to residential water customers than to commercial users. That is across the board, nowhere else, it's not like that anywhere else. High Point is the only where that's comparable and they charge a flat rate across. Bottom line, we need a flat rate for our full system, full stop, and that should include, like you guys have mentioned, gratefully, uh, the other fees that are included because a service user like me who may or may not have housing the entire year and has constantly had to pay water turn on services mm. with bad credit. I have bad credit, not scared to admit it. I've had to pay $155 every new time I turn on water. And when you are a renter in a single family home, which is sometimes cheaper than apartments, you often are the one that pays the water turn on fee, not the landlord because they have no responsibility to that. Okay, and then finally, um, for storm water fees, I know we're, that's pretty good, but I just want to throw out there in the future, maybe we could scale them by surface permeability. Uh, they are. They like, are. as in, okay. Thank you. And runoff production. I don't know if that is in our fee schedule already, but we need to, okay. We're, uh, I'm getting some sort of You're okay. Right. Um, You're still I'm, good. They are. You have Thank another you. minute. You got a minute. Okay. You have to okay. In that case, I will say that I do think that the multifamily versus single family use is potentially a geographic conflict of interest that we need to examine closer with regard to the Sullivan Act because as we scale to more renting that is not really regulated, we don't have the facilities to regulate the way that short-term and long-term renting is happening, we need to be aware of the ways that that might actually be a geographical tier in disagreement to what our laws are supposed to say. Okay, that's it. Sorry. Thanks or for a coming. customer class. I wonder if that would be a way to do it. Brad, look at that. Um, and the stormwater is based on the surface area, impermeable mm -hmm. surface area, right? I got it right, yes. Like, for example, the mall has to pay a big fee because right. it's got the same. Okay. Good point, though. Thank you. That was all we had signed up to speak under the fees. You're under the general public comment. I know. Did you change your mind? Good. Okay. You don't like uh, well, instead of later, or do as we feel, well as he's, later? So is, uh, which one do you prefer? You, you're giving up your one for through. the end of the meeting. No. 
<laughs> Can't you sign up mid-process? Come on, we're halfway, come on. I mean, Sarah is like literally typing his name in. I just saw that there were uh, 11 manufacturers listed there for, you know. But it might have been, we learned that some of them have multiple taps, so it might actually be less than 11. I'm, okay, that's fine. I just wanted to review the history of when that tier was created, which I believe was 2013, and that was all done, the, um, the one for the manufacturer over 2,000 CCFs was created for New Belgium when they came here. And so in our beer city and all of that and the water usage, that needs to be looked at because their usage of water is a, is a tax write-off. You know, and then, like we just bent over for them when they got here, and we we're giving away all of this preci uh, precious resource. So, it's just a little impromptu, and I won't take any more time. And thank you for your uh, thank you. Three percent of water production comes from the infection, by the way. Um, when I first came on council, I never heard the end of Gerber. Gerber used to be in Asheville, and they used the water, and that was what I was told was the basis for the rate structure. And then we lost Gerber, and it was like a big thing. They made baby food. Anyway, so another exportable good that uses our money <laughs> or used. Um, okay, so we we have a motion and a second. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, thank you. We have reached the end of our agenda. We are blowing Maggie's timeline. Maggie, the clerk. It's timeline. actually not far off. Um, I mean, it's well, incredibly. She said eight thirty-five. Okay, so we have um, wow. a few people signed up under general public comment. The first is Nina Tovish. Good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and Council Members. I will try not to take any more than absolutely necessary of your time. Congratulations on passing, on adopting the Municipal Climate Action Plan. That's wonderful. It's a great step toward our future. And I was pleasantly surprised to enter the council chamber with Ben Stockdale, who's a friend. I didn't expect to see him here. But I would like to take an opportunity, as I had planned to talk about this myself, to echo and amplify some of his sentiments. I think what we can learn from the first step of a municipal climate action plan, which is directed at city operations only, is that it's important to zoom out and think about the bigger responsibilities of city government towards our community, our city, and even beyond in the county. And the importance of wielding the influence of the municipality wherever possible. That includes in zoning, it includes new, in new construction projects, both residential and commercial, and perhaps considering new incentives for building in a sustainable fashion. It also means actively making outreach to renewable energy sector jobs, manufacturing, setting an example in your own budget commitments, which makes it easy for those kinds of entities to do business in our city. It also inclu means including and empowering our educational institutions helping people be prepared to work in an economic sector which is growing by leaps and bounds and is also important for the sustainability of our future community. What I'm trying to say is I urge you to be bold and visionary in drawing attention to Asheville as a place that has already got tremendous investment and potential in renewable technologies and uh, education We've got resources here, we've got people here, we've got not-for-profits here, we've got enterprise here, all moving into this sector, but we can do more and better. Drawing attention to Asheville as a promising locus for this important economic driver and a critical foundation for the thriving future of our community. So I hope that as you move forward in policy making, in ordinances, in zoning, that you make this a constant priority to help Asheville make a pivot towards the sector which is growing, which provides high wage jobs for people who are prepared and educated to work in it. This is, I hope, the future for Asheville. I'd like to see us 
making progress as being seen as the climate city, as a national leader in these kinds of initiatives. Thank you for making this first step. I hope you'll think bigger and bigger going forward. Have a lovely evening <laughs> as soon as we manage to get out of here. Thank Thanks you. For saying so. um, Jonathan Wainscott. All right, hey, my name is Jonathan Wayne Scott. Thanks for the time just a second ago. Uh, on uh, April 21st, 1931, the city of Asheville held a referendum to change our, uh, our city charter to establish an entirely new city charter and an election system uh, in a form of government, the council form that we have now, uh, manager form. But just 10 weeks before that, uh, the North Carolina legislature passed the Howell Reed bill, and that was to specifically repeal absentee balloting from municipal elections here in Buncombe County. And it was a six-year effort for the people of this area to get that uh, done. I'll just read what the Asheville citizen said then. The, uh, the Senate this afternoon passed the Howell Reed bill to repeal the absentee ballot law for local elections in Buncombe County on the second and third readings despite opposition that grew to formidable proportions near the end of the 20 minute debate. The vote on the final reading stood at 25 to 19 and if Senator Bernard, who was our senator here, had delayed five seconds in demanding a standing vote, the bill would have been killed. On the eyes and the nose, uh, the Senate's presiding officer, Lieutenant Governor Richard T. Fountain ruled, the nose seemed to have it. Before he said the clinching words, the nose have it, Senator Bernard jumped to his feet, demanding a division on the standing vote. Senator Bernard's friends rallied to his aid, 25 senators standing in favor of the measure. It was a tribute to the senator's personal popularity because many of the Senate leaders were inclined to junk it. The bill will be ratified tomorrow, which becomes law. Mrs. E.L. McKee, first uh, female senator in North Carolina, uh, from Jackson County voted for the measure, and Senator K.E. Bennett of Bryson City was absent from the floor. The Republican minority leader voted against it. Before passing the Buncombe bill, the Senate voted down amendments that would also exempt the entire state and several individual counties, including Sampson and Polk, from provisions of the absentee ballot law. In his speech in support of the amendment for Polk County, Senator McLean criticized the Senate for its action in extending privileges to Buncombe County that it denied other counties of the state. Buncombe County doesn't need it any more than Polk or any other county in the state, he declared. The only difference between Polk and Buncombe is that, it, is that a women's league in Buncombe County is able to holler louder <laughs> and they have money to send telegrams to us. The same conditions exist in Polk County and I demand the same privileges. The Senator paid his respects to the group of Buncombe County persons who had sent him the telegrams declaring they were anti-ring Democrats and had deserted their party. Failing in his amendment, Senator McLean sought to have the bill labeled special privilege to Buncombe County, but was ruled out of order by the presiding uh, <laughs> officer. Um, anyway, there's a lot more around the, the Howell Reed Act, but it was the uh, Buncombe Women's League who were most ardent in disenfranchising black voters 10 weeks before we had a referendum here. Thank you very Thank much. You. Have a good night. And happy Sorry. women's history. Tonight's <laughs> history lesson. What did you say? Happy women's history. Oh. Uh, Tim Sadler. Take us home, Tim. Gosh, I, I just can't get enough of you guys. Um, I, um, I just I wanted to kind of follow up on something that was mentioned earlier with the, um, you know, the whole South Slope conversation as, you know, it relates to being historically black neighborhood and, and, and having such historic elements of the city. I mean, most notably the, um, the baseball team. And what a great moment it is for the tourist to potentially step up and, and help in doing something to memorialize something in that area. I, I, I don't know if that's really something that the community wants. I'm kind of speaking out of turn in a way because I haven't been here um, for some time, two years. But I do know that there was always a lot of um, pride, you know, in, in, you know, it was specifically that team. And it's just a great attraction potentially to 
you know, hopefully the TDA could potentially pony up and, and, and help with some kind of an effort. Um, but I mean, more than anything in that whole sl South Slope conversation to have, to make sure that there's more inclusion. Yeah, there might not be a lot of black people living there now, but you know, if that's the history, then they should really be integrated in the going forward because it really is a, 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 a high-end paradise over there and it's not inclusive at all as from what I've gathered. But um, yeah, I just wanted to kind of offer that. I know the tourists have gotten a huge, you know, or I don't know if that's coming, but they're, they're gonna be um, having um, some benefits you know, coming their way potentially with the city. So, you know, hopefully there could be some carrot, and carrot uh, from, from their side too. Um, thanks, guys. Thank you. Welcome back, Tim. We, we do not have a closed session, right? No. Oh, we do? No. no. It's, 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 it's just like three more hours. It's hard. It's a long day. We're adjourned. Yeah, you've been up really.